Hello and welcome back to Say a Spotlight. This is episode 125 and we're your hosts Jake and Matt covering all the events of match day 35 in Say a Aha, uh-huh. from now on just three matches to go of the Say a season. Of course, we have our champions. We extend another congratulations to Winter. Um but obviously still a lot to play for with the relegation battle once again intensifying and the race for Europe getting even juicier with Atalanta overtaking Roma with a game in hand. Indeed, these minnow teams have really stepped up mm-hmm. and this is the point in the season where they look even better than the top teams to be honest on occasion. A lot like of the- upsets yeah. this week. We'll get into them soon but a few fair upsets. And many teams resting players because of European commitments as well, which makes the likes of Udinese, Sassuolo, even Salernitana look better. Yeah, and even fucking teams like Roma in particular and teams like Atalanta, like they don't know where to place their eggs in which yeah, basket yeah, yeah, at yeah. the moment. This is the the famous dilemma that Mourinho had last season where he's like, look, we're going to put everything into the Europa League, jeopardize the league entirely, lost in the final of the Europa League, had nothing to show for it. De Rossi now finding himself in a very, very similar situation, man. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we'll get into all that. Of course, our goal of the week went to, or goes to rather, Coop Miners for his strike against Saler Netana. I like the way he disguised that shot. Yeah. He made it look like he wasn't going to shoot and he just curled it. Um, sniped it into the bottom corner I mean we often say this is one of the most technically gifted and intelligent players that we have in the league absolutely we must safeguard him as as, as much as we can Um, uh, he he only scores spectacular goals man yes and um, in this game in particular Atalanta were struggling before Mm. they brought him on and he came on and provided a hockey assist immediately. He whipped it to Pasalic, who squared yeah. it to, Kuma, um, to, to Skamaka. Skamaka, who finished. And then he scored the winner, you know. So, yeah, um, Coop Miners is just phenomenal. Yeah, I think we we'll have to give an honorable mention to Juric. Mm-hmm. Because, my God, what a header yeah. in the Violent. dying moments Violent of the game. It, it is. Like, you could only see a sea of blue shirts around that ball. You could barely see Juric. Yeah. Um, He's not even facing goal. He doesn't even seem to swing his head towards goal. But the amount of power and accuracy he gets behind that header to equalize in the last minute of the game. Absolutely. Amazing. Could have been our goal of the week. And I guess Chauna's goal was pretty nice as well. goal was lovely, yes. Um, he took it really well. Um, technique was nice on it. Uh, I'm not sure if he meant that dribble. I'm not sure if he lost control of the ball. At His the, first touch the was end. a bit uh, shit. But, but it was a very nice strike, to be honest. Crown is very hit or miss. He's very raw. I think he should stay with Saler Nathan and see what he can do in Serie B, you know, because he needs the experience. Yeah, he's, a, yeah. he's a good talent. Uh-huh. He'll, he'll do bits in Serie B. He'll have a lot to say about getting them back up to Ah. Um, currently, as we're speaking, it is half time in the Conference League semi final between um, Fiorentina and Club Bruges. Club Bruges, Jesus. Um, the score is currently 1 0 to Club Bruges. Fiorentina don't look great at the minute. Um, obviously, Fiorentina did win the first leg 3 2, um, but now they are away from home against Club Bruges, um, trailing 1 0. So. If it stays like this, extra time, penalties, but we'll see what Italiano's men can do. Um, tomorrow, we have Europa League action between Roma and... My God, why am I blanking out so much? It's between, um, it's Roma, Roma and Leverkusen. Leverkusen, yes. Leverkusen obviously winning that first leg, two goals to nil. Um, Roma, you know, they had a few tough games in a row as well. They just played the Derby del Sole against Napoli. Right after that, they had a game against Juve, um, sandwiched them between two Europa League ma- semi-finals against Leverkusen, and now upcoming they have Atalanta. They had the midweek 15-minute match against Udinese as well. It is not easy at the moment for Roma, and to be honest, I think they are absolutely down and out as they travel to Germany for the second leg. Yeah, and it's going to be a difficult one for them, and if they pull it off, it would be a Barcelona 3-0 style miracle, to uh-huh, be honest uh-huh. with you, because this... This team looks, they look primed Leverkusen and proper. Leverkusen are unbeaten in unbeaten, like yeah. fucking 40-something matches, They man. looked comfortable at the Olympico, man. There's this thing, they they might win the first, um, 
Invincible treble. Now, of course, treble not including Champions League, but Europa mm. League. Um, but the first invincible treble ever, man. Wild, huh? Xabi Alonso is doing absolute bits over there and getting the best out of some players. Verts, for example. Keep in mind, this is a team he took over when they were 17th in the league. Yeah. And he's managed to transform players like Verts, who is a, a, a candidate for Ballon d'Or this year. He absolutely is Verts. Um, but that's enough about that. Atalanta um, drew away to Marseille with the score of 1-1, which is actually a great result considering the stadium and the supporters of Marseille. They're fucking yeah. petrifying. Man. Yeah, they, yeah, they definitely are. Mm. And now they go um, to Bergamo tomorrow with a 1-1. You could call it somewhat of an advantage. Um, with they have them home being advantage. Home. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, but again, sandwiched between... Okay, they just played Southern Italiana, but they're playing Roma. Absolutely. So it's, yes. it's, it's tough for everyone. We have our first Champions League finalist as well, even though it doesn't include anything Italian. It's Borussia Dortmund. And mm. Shout out to them for knocking out PSG. Um, fellow Milan fans who still have a bit, bitter taste in their mouth with PSG. It just reminds you of Thiago Silva, Ibrahimovic, um, Donnarumma. Yeah. So nice to see them getting knocked out. <laughs> yeah, and not, not, not only that... But as, as Milan supporters, can't help but think because Milan have done nothing but fall short this season. Just slightly, oh, every time, just second best in every single occasion. But what you see in the Champions League group of death is that Dortmund, who Milan held and should have beat in the first game, and PSG, who Milan beat, faced off in the semi finals, Dortmund threw. To the Champions League final. Yeah, that's a classic case of that could have been us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before we move on, I'd like to thank our patrons for their monthly contribution. Thank you very much to Alan, Andrew, Andy, Anthony, Tim, Campbell, Sluge, McNoodle, Lena, David, Kyle, Luca, Matthias, Mint, Michael, Tonna, and Ed. Thank you very much for your constant support of the show. Um, Honestly, you keep us going. Thank you. Yeah, and the daily chat as well. Um, yes. Full of knowledge. Uh, if you guys want Bantam. to become uh, patrons as well, it's three ninety nine a month. Um, we can't offer you many perks. It is for you to support our podcast if you want us to do more high quality content and improve our content. However, we do have a fun little group chat that you'll be added to, and you do get to see. They some got some behind, behind the, scenes. the scenes. Yeah, that's that's what I was about to say. I'm from last episode. We had to actually mm. pause the last episode because we were too intoxicated at one point um, fucking workers day yeah. baby and um, and there's just a hilarious clip that we sent on our um, yeah. Patreon chat which, yeah. was, which was absolutely great and um, one correction from the last episode by the way uh-huh. the, the chant of El Azuzi right mm-hmm. um, it's not cigarettes it's fumo which translates to smoke they're talking about mm. five euro ganja by the five, way. Euro five euro ganja, ganja. El Azuzi <laughs> <laughs> Everyone will see you in San Donato then. <laughs> yes, fantastic. Let's Some go. Some five bro. euro grain, baby. Five euro <laughs> grain. Um, let's get into the... Wait, of course, before we get into the rundown, um, don't forget to like our content. Um, follow us on our socials. We're on YouTube, TikTok, Twitter. Um, um, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're yeah, everywhere. absolutely everywhere. Um, don't follow us on YouTube. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, and drop us a five-star rating wherever you're getting your podcast. Um, we'll go straight to the rundown. We'll start things off with Roma 1, Juve 1. Um, a tight affair between these two teams. A very, very entertaining affair. Very end-to-end stuff. Um, we got to see very, very high um, high level football in this game. And, and a game that meant a lot for both teams as they're battling for Champions League. Um, Sassuolo 1, Inter 0. Inter's second loss of the season. And their second loss against Sassuolo. Sassuolo battling relegation in 19th place. But whenever they face Inter, they tend to get three points. Obviously, (laughs) for those of you listening without video, Jake just flipped his hat around and he is sporting a Sassuolo hat, which we got from the Mape Stadium. Amazing stuff. Um, an Inter fan actually gave that to us yeah, because we hadn't gotten our hands on it and an Inter fan handed it to us. They were so sweet. The They're amazing. They were amazing. They were amazing. <laughs> when Berardi scored and had celebrated, they were just like, come on, guys. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> you, you know this is how they were looking at us because we were shouting, Memo! They were looking at us going, Memo! Memo! 
purely taking the piss out of us. Um, that Saswala Jake had a famous tweet um, that went viral in the past saying that Saswala are essentially the Robin Hood of Syria because they take points from the big teams and they give them to the small teams. And that is exactly once again what they've been doing this season. Um, Milan 3, Genoa 3 in a very, very entertaining yet odd and unsettling evening. And I say that because... The Curva Sud, which are some of the best supporters in Italy, um, had a silent protest because Milan essentially are winless in their last six games in all competitions. Um, they left in the 80th minute as well. They found themselves trailing. Milan managed to get it back to 3-2, but then uh, a Chao on goal, unfortunately, made it 3-3 for Genoa. A lot of back and forth in that game. The protest is more about the direction that the management is taking when it comes to appointing a coach, which okay. makes, which makes um, to be honest, a bit of sense. I mean, if you're protesting because of the results towards the end of the season when there's nothing to play for... It doesn't really make much um, much sense, but but uh-huh, um, the Lopetegi links went down very badly yeah. with, with Milan fans. Um, now there is Concesao rumors. I would like to down. discuss Concesao, and then um, later on the feedback that I've gotten from Taco, for example, one yeah. of our um, patrons, has been negative because he's very is very old school mm. manager by the book. He's always complaining and whining. Um, mm. He's got a way with the big players, man. He brings them down to earth. Um, to be honest, he, he likes a 4-4-2. To be Flat. honest, from, from what I've seen of Porto and the Champions League, I kind of like the way they play football. I like the way. That, I'm, not, I'm not opposed I'm to not opposed, very pragmatic football. I'm, I'm like, not opposed to Conceição in the slightest. Yeah. Just like 49 years approach. old, Portuguese. He can have that Portuguese link with mm-hmm. Leao. Portugal. Portugal. <laughs> Portugal. <laughs> um, I... I'm a fan, for example, of, of these managers who aren't super offensive or super defensive. They're somewhere in the middle. It's mm. balance, you know, mm. like Gilardino. Gilardino exactly. is the perfect exactly. example. Exactly, great example. Motta isn't a fucking... Don't imagine Motta to be this offensive master. No, 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 His no, approach no. is super balanced as well. Yeah. I think it's, it's the way to go, to be honest, if you want results. I think... Well, it, it is certainly one of the ways to go. Yeah. Um, I think I think he'll, he'll be not directly a good fit, but I think... He gives you that kind of conte, kind mm. of like you're gonna have to work for it, kind he's of a, thing. It's like a clean he's slate. He's an authority. Aha, uh-huh, like that's Milan need an authority. With Pioli, I feel like you could get away with some midnight cheese here and there. You know, this <laughs> yeah. guy, there is no fucking midnight cheese, man. Yeah. Um, Monza two, Lazio two. A last minute with a last minute equalizer rather by Milan Juric. I heard an interesting stat about Juric. Actually, he is the player um, that wins the most headers mm. in Serie A per game. He heads the ball an average of six times. Oh my god! Second is Yaka Bijol, three times. <laughs> so wow. this guy is just head, head, heading the ball yeah. double more then than you go the person. To the, to the post match interview, it's like Juric, what do you make of your performance? <laughs> 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 it's like Mike Tyson after a fight. Uh, Torino nil, Bologna nil. Congratulations to Ivan Ivan Juric um, for his ninth nil nil of the season wow. out of fourteen draws. His ninth nil nil. He likes um, a nice round zero. Yeah, man. He's yeah, got yeah, zero yeah. goal difference as well. Torino. This yes, season. yes. They they've only scored thirty one goals in thirty five games, which is like the seventeenth best. So three from the bottom, yeah. essentially. But they've only conceded 31, which is the fourth best. Um, <laughs> wow, the so, duality of man. Uh-huh, I have some points to make about Juric as well later on. Um, Bologna, they're, they're confirmed Europe, but they're really stalling this Champions League qualification, man. Um, Verona 2, Fiorentina nil. Massive win again. I couldn't speak highly enough of what Verona are doing at the moment. It's still tight. It doesn't mean they're safe by any by any means whatsoever. Um, but Tiani Noslin, once again, the hero over here for Verona, um, in a tough, tough fixture against Fiorentina. Um, but they managed to get the job done. And making his debut on our cover. Yeah, congratulations, Tiani. Um, and the first Tiani, surprisingly. Mm, that's true. <laughs> um, Udinese won, Napoli won, a last-minute equaliser by Fabio Cannavaro's men. Um, it's interesting, not much has changed in the way Udinese play football, but they have that fresh grit about them, like they've just uh-huh. appointed a new manager, and it seems to be working quite decently. They're still in trouble, still a lot of work to be done. I still probably bet on... 
I don't know. I'm going to stop right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, Salernitana 1, Atalanta 2. Atalanta seemed to be struggling a little bit in the beginning. Um, they, they're rotating. Yeah. Um, Salernitana did score against the run of play, and then when they brought in the big guns, like Skamaka was playing well all game, then they mm. brought in Coop Miners, and he just mm. flicked the switch. Atalanta, like this, they, they have officially overtaken Roma while still having a game in hand against Fiorentina. What a massive season for Atalanta, honestly. Talk about Bologna because they hadn't done it in so long, so on and so forth. But do not sleep on the fantastic season Atalanta are having. You know, past few seasons, 7th, 8th, 6th. They haven't been in the mix at all. But wow, wow. Slow and steady wins the race. Um, Cagliari won, Lecce won. Cagliari um, opened the scoring and then Gaetano got sent off just before halftime. They managed to hold on for so long, but then Lecce get the equalizer in the 84th and then go on to hit the post twice after that. So it was a really the most useless whirlwind. challenge, the most unnecessary challenge I've seen. I think late, late Oof. challenge. The studs were high up to the knee, man. It was stupid. And then you know what pisses me off? It's like. You obviously know that. So why are you yeah. sarcastically applauding the referee? Why are you being such a pain in the ass? Like I, I, I hate it when players are obviously wrong. They react. They know they're on camera. They know they're going to look dumb. I hate it. Yeah. Um, he doesn't really care though because he has a beard that doesn't connect. So. <laughs> I thought you were going to say because he's back off the yeah. top. <laughs> <laughs> no, because his beard doesn't connect. Um Empoli nil, Frosinone and nil to put the cherry on top of the cake of this fantastic episode, right? Nothing yeah. like a relegation six pointer ending nil nil. Um, you know who scored that game and got this allowed? Ah, Jazzy. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> My God. The, the, uh, he is one of those players. I wouldn't be surprised if he had negative goals in a season like <laughs> Jazzy. He's one of the only ones. Um, shall we kick things off, brother, with Roma 1, Juve 1? Absolutely. So the previous encounter was a 1-0 victory for Juve. Roma were coming off the Derby del Sole, followed by a disappointing semi-final 2-0 home loss to the mighty Leverkusen. Um, Roma decided to rest Gianluca Mancini, Tammy Abraham and Stefano Sharawi. Juve had time to rest for this direct battle for Champions League, knowing a win here would guarantee them a spot in the Champions League. They had to make due without Keenan Yildiz, Yildiz and Alexandro, and had only won two of their last 13 Serie A matches. Um, also, obviously, Ruolo del Lex over here for Paredes and Debala. Mm-hmm. So, a lot of... Um, obviously, Roma and Juve have a history. Um, they're both battling for Europe over here. It was a six-pointer for Europe. X is on one team. There was a lot going on over here. Um, a lot on the line. It was a 4-3-2-1 Christmas tree formation for the Rossi's men with Zvilar in goal and a backline of Christensen, Llorente, Indica and Angelino. Christensen starting because Karsdorp absolutely fucked Roma in the, in the semi-finals yeah. against Leverkusen, playing them clean through on goal. You can't make mistakes like that against a team like that. Midfield three of Cristante, Paredes and Pellegrini. I couldn't highlight how good I feel Paredes has been recently ah, for he's, Roma. He's been yes, super. Uh, his, his, his balls have <laughs> just grown and grown and grown and grown. I don't think he's ever had a problem in that department. Yeah, that. It's, it's true. It's true. But it's, it's it, his entire game. Like. It's true. It's true. The, the classic against Holland when yeah. he smashed the ball onto the bench. Um, Dybala and Baldanzi flanking Big Rom. 3-5-2 for Juve. Wojciech Szczesny in goal on the back line of Gatti, Bremer and Danilo. Um, Wea out on the right, Cambiaso on the left and a midfield three of McKenny, Locatelli and Rabiot with Chiesa and Vlaovic starting up front together. So a deep cross by Angelino was headed into the crossbar by Christensen in the 10th minute as Roma started fierce and they started rough. In fact, just five minutes later, the 15th minute, Big Rom opened the scoring. Um, it was a low cross by Baldanzi that caused problems for the Juve defence and Lukaku slotted in a rebound following a Cristante attempt. However, in the 31st minute, just 15 minutes later, there was some brilliant work by Chiesa as he put Pellegrini on his ass and delivered a peach of a cross to Bremer who rose and headed in brilliantly for what seemed to be a very easy goal. Yes, did you Juve. see Pellegrini's reaction to that? No. After he, he got up, like when he got up, 
um, Chiesa had already whipped it in and Bremer yeah. had already headed it home. And Pellegrini's just like, like what? Like, what can I do? Yeah. <laughs> just, what can I do? He put me on my ass. There's nothing we could have done about it. Like, there's there's so much I want to say about Chiesa yeah. after yeah. this game. He's been he's been back. Yeah. And then just after the restart, Chiesa <laughs> almost scored. An amazing, amazing goal as he skipped past Christensen and rattled the inside of the far post with a very promising, direct and powerful strike. This is the thing, right? Because he received the ball a little bit awkwardly. The defenders managed to take shape. But then Chiesa looks forward and he just sees, okay, it's a one-on-one and I fancy myself. So he, he... Chiesa always fancies himself. He always goes for the 1v1. If you're a defender backing up and hoping he's going to take it to the wing or something, forget it. He's going down your throat. He's going to try to get past you. And that's exactly what he did there. Danilo headed the ball off the line in the 68th minute after a Christensen strike. Zvilar denied Locatelli in the 78th, albeit the strike was mishit. And then in the 87th, Zvilar got another great save, tipping Keane's header over the bar. Roma could have won it at the end, but once again, it was disappointment for Tammy Abraham. This time, he buffered for a bit too long before getting his shot away, which was easily saved by Chesney. Obviously, the reason I'm saying again was because he did miss an open goal in the final moments of the semi-final against Leverkusen. This um, situation was, was hard, though, for, for Tammy, yeah, with, with Chesney rushing out, and I think he actually angled his shot pretty well, because it, it almost went under Chesney's legs. Chesney kind of fell onto it. He did really well to make himself big. Chesney did Uh well. Um, However, he he took his time to get the shot away when the ball Mm. was coming. Like over there, I first, I don't think you should take a touch, but he he was setting himself up for a bit too long. Um, Over there, I feel like as a striker, you need to attack the ball because, you know, you've got defenders charging in and they're about to slide. So they're about to extend themselves and put their bodies in front of the ball. So whack the ball the second that you receive it I, and I just feel like had it been another striker maybe I'd give them the benefit of the doubt but Tammy Abraham sometimes it just seems like when he's not on and he never has a game where he misses a few chances and then he scores you know what yeah, I mean he's yeah, either yeah. totally on or totally off that's still true. recovering from injury obviously coming back in slowly so can't maybe be too hard that's why he took the touch to be honest because of a lack of confidence yeah possibly possibly um I thought Juve didn't look themselves in this game in a good way Mm. uh, because they seemed offensive. um, And just to highlight, obviously, and start the conversation about Federico Chiesa because his performance over here, the last time I saw him play a game like this was in the Euros 2020. Uh Um, Obviously not quite there yet. And I don't even know if he will get there again because that was just incredible form that he was on during the Euros. But um, yeah, he was... Very good this game. And he has been very good. And what you said about Juve not looking themselves rings Mm. absolutely true. And it has been the case since after that Torino game. Mm. The Torino game was like a nil-nil with an XG of 0.05 for each team. Uh The Milan game, Juve... They gave had the Milan ball. hell. Milan yeah. didn't even have a single shot on target and they mm. were just pressing and pressing and pressing and they were quite unlucky not to get the victory, to be honest. Mm. And this game, again, man, they took a while to kind of grow into the game. I thought the beginning was all Roma. But then eventually when they grew into it in, at the end of the first half, they continued and took that energy to the second half. Mm-hmm. And I thought they were quite unlucky not to come out with a victory because they had two chances that were saved brilliantly by Zvila. Uh-huh. Locatelli... And um, Locatelli, I have them here. I can't and remember. Keen, the, Keen header. the header at the end, man. Oh my god, what a save! Yeah, I, to, to be honest, Similar I, saves both uh-huh. kind of falling backwards. Yeah, I, I don't think it's like a change in style or anything of the sort from you. I just simply think that in the games that they've been playing recently since after the Torino game, um, they've needed to win because they've been stalling this automatic qualification mm-hmm. for Champions League for so long, and they're always a goal away. So they yeah. just need to keep on pushing it's until true. the end. It, I think it literally is as simple as that. I don't think Allegri's going out there and playing modern football. You know what I mean? It's like, go, I'm freaking out. I don't out, know. Man. They're pushing higher up. And having Cambiazzo and Of course Chiesa they Because they need play, a goal. Yeah. They obviously need a goal. And Three games to go. Yes. Um, and they need three points. So they're either going to draw think, every single game. I think now they need two. Two? I think two. Maybe. Because they, okay. they needed a, a victory against Roma. 
to qualify, I believe. Um, maybe my maths is wrong. But they did a win against Roma, but they got one point. So I guess two points. Okay, really. okay. Totally doable. They have Salernitana next. Um, I've been a real big fan of this Cambiazo and Chiesa on the same side attacking. Yeah. They look really good together. Mm. I think uh, um, Cambiazo offers a little bit more than Kostic does nowadays. Mm. Especially because of how ambidextrous and technical he yeah. is. Do you think that Chiesa is turning the heat up, turning the gas up mm. on the hob because he's just ready for the summer competition. He's just ready for the Euros. The Euros could very much be Chiesa's competition. Now. I'm sure that's a factor, but it's also the case that, um, you know, timeline-wise, it makes sense. He came back from injury. He took some time finding himself again. You know, he was criticized for, for losing his explosivity, everyone yeah. was saying, and all that. But it takes a while, you know. Injuries take a mental toll on you, you know. And now he seems comfortable yeah. playing again. He seems comfortable to go into those 50-50s and to maybe dribble when it's risky when you're going to get hit. He, he seems back mm -hmm. um, to his best when it comes to that. Man, when he's in form like this, all you want to do in a game is give him the ball mm -hmm. and let him figure it out because he makes it He makes it happen. He makes it work. And that's what you were doing. And then, um, But for some fucking reason... <laughs> or another Allegri decided to take him out in the 75th minute when he was literally everything for you uh -huh. eh? everything uh -huh. for them it was odd what I found even weirder but considering Roma's schedule I understand a little bit more and maybe the nature of the player is maybe a little bit more than I would with Chiesa the Bala was subbed off at half time hmm. Hmm. That is weird. against his ex-team three points needed did he well, absolute must win? But was there any report of a, of a knock or something? I don't or? believe so. Not not that I found during my research, man. That's bizarre, actually. That's really weird. I guess maybe preparation. The, the, ah, the, the Rossi has made it clear. Ah, and they He's have... not prioritizing shit. Absolutely. And um, that could be the case, actually. They have a return leg to play. Mm. They need their best players available. Um, plus, they've been playing a lot of football lately. And the Bala does struggle with injury, as does Chiesa. And that would probably explain both substitutions, to be honest. Especially the Chiesa one, you know. He's on for 70 minutes. I mean, you've given him enough time. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. um, granted, if anyone's going to turn the game around, it's him. And taking out Chiesa, you're literally taking out all of Juve's uh -huh. creativity. Uh -huh. Like, the second he was out, Juve stopped. There, and, there weren't any more. Uh -huh. And he, he took out... Chiesa and Vlahovic at the same time. One player that was playing phenomenally well. <laughs> the other one, man, Vlahovic. Look, it's not always the case because I've often defended him in saying Vlahovic doesn't get as many goals as he did at Fiorentina with Juve because of Allegri's game style, because he mm -hmm. doesn't play to Vlahovic's strengths and he should because he's a world-class striker. Bro... Vlavic has a massive habit of disappearing and missing chances. Missing chances is the worst one of them. All, huge, think, he, huge he's factor. Wasteful. Huge he's factor wasteful. in his game, man. He's, he, there are times where he's so sharp and his left foot is so precise and he's confident and he's getting on free kicks and he's getting on penalties and he's scoring headers. Left foot, right foot, everything. And then there are periods where... He can't get anything right. And and at the moment, he's very much going through that spell. And let's take it back 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. When Vlaovic hadn't scored... Because I got some stick on a TikTok for this, I yes. remember. Vlaovic hadn't scored for like 10 matches or something like that. And then he scored one. And he spammed his celebration. Ah, yes, he yes, was going yes. like, Calma, I'm here. I can't hear you, but shh. Like he was doing absolutely too much and everything. It's like, bro, you haven't proven shit just by scoring one goal. You know what I mean? You're not silencing anyone. Like, what are you doing? You know? And now the season has progressed and lo and behold, he still hasn't upped his game after that. He had a period of three, four games where he was back on it. Um, but very streaky. For an 80 million signing and a super expensive player to have in your team, very fucking streaky, man. Yes, yes, super streaky. Um, it's a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, and I'm sure it's it's purely mental, uh, once again, because he's clearly got incredible technique and we've seen him score goals. But he takes your breath away. Those yeah. two goals against Tempoli, I think two seasons ago, mm. come to mind. Where the free kick, I think. Was it a free kick? No, they were like two one-on-ones, but like the way he... 
There was one he took the ball down and just deleted his man, but the touch was incredible. Ah, and then okay. the finish is fucking laser, man. You mm-hmm. know, um, Robocop. I think with the game, the way it went, surprisingly, Roma would be the happier ones with this point because Roma had their back towards the ropes as Juve kept on attacking and attacking. Um, Roma have now been overtaken by Atalanta, who have that game in hand against Fiorentina. Um Along with an upcoming direct encounter. If you were the Rossi, <laughs> toughest question in the world, yeah. right? Where would you place your focus? You have the Europa League and you have the league. In the league at this point. Eh? I mean, the Europa League is a, is a tough one for them now. It's it's an uphill battle. I know you need to believe and all that, but it's looking quite unrealistic. Mm. So if I were the Rossi, I would have, I would have gone on, gone guns blazing against this Juve team. But you know you yeah. can never tell because they had the first leg to play and they wasted a lot. They mm. used a lot of energy in that one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh-huh. I the think thing the is, league is the priority. The thing is, the league is no longer in their hands, bro. That's that, that's the fucking thing. Because just look at the table over here. So they are okay. They're level on points with Atalanta. Atalanta have that game in hand, which should put them three points above. And then there's the direct encounter. So it's it's tough. It's not in their hands because of Atalanta keep on winning game after game. And there's absolutely nothing they can absolutely. do. Whereas the Europa League, if one of those European night Manolas, the Greek god in Rome, fucking something uh-huh. like that just brews up, that is in their hands. Fair enough. You fair know? enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's, it's, um, tough. it's tough. Atalanta, however... Have you remember they, they're still in the Coppa Italia and they're in the Europa League uh-huh. and they need to play Marseille they have as the well. final on the 15th. They, yes, they've got the final on the 15th. They've got Lecce who are fighting to be honest, um, not really for their lives at this point, mm. but yes, yeah, essentially, you know. Um, they've got Torino, who are always a tough gig, and and then that head to head against Roma. So in theory, they play th- they play Lecce three days after a final against Juventus, mm. you know, and they play Roma only a few days after um, playing Marseille in the, in the Europa League. Uh-huh. This is tight for them. I don't know. I just think, as De Rossi said, you know, we're not prioritizing anything. Every game in front of us is the game in front uh-huh. of us. We're uh-huh. taking it game by game. Yeah. Imagine the ball that gets injured or something. <laughs> that would be so catastrophic be for so typical, Roma. No? Um, but for Roma, I think it's a good thing that they have De Rossi with them throughout this tough period because, mm-hmm. again, they've made it very clear we're willing to die for this man. And that's a, a, a breath of, of fresh air that Roma needed. Um, Roma, again, they find themselves in sixth place. They are actually level on points with Atalanta, but behind them due to goal difference. Um whilst Madonna Juve find themselves in third on 66 points. Now Bologna are just two points behind them. Absolutely. Um, Sassuolo won. Inter nil. So the hat's <laughs> turning again. Um, let's take a look at the lineups for this one. So Consili was in goal for Sassuolo with Erlich, Kumbulla and Ferrari at the back. This was a 3-5-2. Ballardini with the masterclass over here, mirroring Inzaghi's system to perfection. Purely take note. <laughs> Tolian was on the right with Josh Doig on the left. Henrique, Lepani and Thordsvet were in the middle. Henrique's job this game was to man-mark Bastoni. The mm-hmm. entire game just sat on him. And he didn't give him any space to, to breathe, basically. Lauriente and Pinamonti were the striking partnership. Lauriente up front is the same logic as Leao up front. No, it's it's uncanny. For Inzaghi's Inter, um, there was a bit of rotation, finally. We were wondering if we were going to see any yeah. rotation. And there was. And I highly doubt he'll be doing it again because they <laughs> lost to Sassuolo. <laughs> Audero was in goal in their usual 3-5-2. Bastoni, Devry and Pavard were at the back with Carlos Augusto on the left, Denzel Dumfries on the right, Mkhitaryan, Aslani and Fratesi in the middle with Sanchez and Martinez up front. The unavailable players, of course, were Tresoldi, who was suspended, Castillo, Defrel and Berardi, who have been out injured, Viti and Thordsvet were also not really fully fit for this one. However, Thordsvet did eventually get the start. 
So Lauriente has scored the only goal of the match for Sassuolo and this goal came after a defensive error by Denzel Dumfries who was dispossessed by Josh Doig near the corner flag. Doig then provided an assist for Lauriente to score with a first time rocket from 10 yards out. Um, funny to see Dumfries making the mistake over here and yeah. the reverse fixture he was one of the goal scorers actually so it's mm. quite this is quite a theme eh, of of um, contrasting uh. performances last week we had we had Chao mm. who had give, who had made a mistake against Juventus and then redeemed himself in the second game that's true against Juventus. Dr Jekyll and Mr yeah. Hyde in that first game the 2-1 victory for Sassuolo the reverse fixture Dumfries scored and then Bayrami and Baradi mm. scored as well. So, yeah, um, what a game that was as well. So, uh, Lautaro scored a goal in the first half. It was chalked off by VAR for him being in an offside position. Um, and this was Inter's second defeat of the season. Both losses coming against Sassuolo. Bro, do you think that um, that this was more... Like, do you think we should be praising Sassuolo more or kind of saying, you know, this is a typical hangover for Inter, you know? Mm, uh, I think you have to praise a team that beats Inter, who looked invincible this season. And Sassuolo are clearly the only team that managed to do it. So you have to take your hats off for Sassuolo. You you keep yours on. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, you, you, you have to praise them. No. Obviously, you could slate the champions Inter for simply not being there in this game. Um, But so many new faces, Sanchez starting up front, Fratesi, Aslani in the middle, um, Audero in goal. Plus, they've already won the league, so they're kind of chillaxing with it. Um, I think they let their guard down, whilst Sassuolo obviously... Hungry as ever because they're fighting relegation. And secondly, as we've often said, these are the occasions that make these players want to perform. No, when they play the top seven teams. Absolutely, yes. And it was interesting to see that Sassuolo did have some fans at the game. It mm. wasn't totally um, empty as it typically is. Uh-huh. I'm not sure if they went to actually watch Sassuolo. We to went to Inter. this exact fixture two seasons ago. The season Milan won the league. And I'm telling it you. It was better though this game. Nice. And I'm Thankfully. telling you, we were among 20 other Sassuolo yeah, fans around yeah. the stadium. Not even exaggerating, Absolutely. man. Against yeah. Inter, like, what are you doing? I liked their approach, man. Um, I like that they built up play from Doig and Ferrari's side because they're mm. better with the ball at their feet than Tolion and Derlich, of course. I liked that they forced Inter out wide, keeping it tight, because in reality, what is Sassuolo's weakness? Their centre-backs. Yeah. However, in the air, they're not too bad. Mm-hmm. So, in fact, the only times that Inter did get close to actually doing some damage to Sassuolo was when they forced play down the middle, and Lautaro was 1v1 against like Ferrari or Ehrlich, mm. and they just rush out aggressively. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. So, so yeah, I'm a big fan of Ballardini's approach over here. Two interesting statistics for you, bro. Um, first of all, this defeat dents Inter's hopes of achieving a club record number of points for the season. Roasted. Roasted, yes. And guess when the last time Inter didn't score a goal was. And I checked this myself. I had to scroll and scroll. There, and there, scroll. Was, there was a statistic that they've they've scored all the time, basically. Yes, that, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, I would guess the last time they didn't score was... February of 2022. No, no. Um, February of 2020 would have been closer. It's April 2023. Uh, of, of, April. I meant, I meant uh, 2023. I meant okay. 2023. <laughs> yeah. Last season. I know. I can barely keep up. With Every time I get used to the 24, it becomes a 25. Hey, man, man. Hey. Jesus Christ. Um, yes, it was the 15th of April 2023 against Monza. Remember the one Nil ah, Caldera scored? Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. That was the last time they hadn't scored a goal. So, yes, props to Sassuolo. You know, hangover or no hangover, this Inter team scores every game. So yeah. the fact that they kept them out was, uh-huh. Uh-huh. was commendable. It's, it's, it's interesting because I have seen Inter struggle for goals when they don't have both Martinez and Turam on the pitch. Um, I think it's a good thing that they're bringing in Taremi next season mm. because they do need additional reinforcements up front. Thankfully for them, they've got the likes of Mikitarian in the middle, Barella in the middle, Chalanoglu, um, fucking Di Marco on the left. So they have 
other people that can get them goals and not just the two yeah. strikers. Um, but occasionally when it's like fucking Lautaro alongside Arnautovic or Thuram alongside Sanchez, they the strikers mm. tend to struggle to find their feet and we have seen we have seen Lautaro struggle in the past. Of course, this season he's been one of the best strikers in the world. <clears throat> but in the past, take it back to February of last season and February of the season before. He usually has a drought every exactly, year. Exactly. Yeah. Around that period, after <laughs> after New Year, there's typically a drought uh-huh. for him. Yeah. Um, too much champagne for Lautaro. <laughs> Um, Frank on Twitter, shout out to Frank, our boy Frank, shout love out Frank. Frankie. Um, he had called us out for basically um, roasting Consili. For destroying Consili. Yes, he's like, boy, you guys pick on Consili a bit too much. And he's like, and this time he said, like, I hope to hear some Consili praise in the next episode. I'm like, we'll give him his flowers, don't worry. Looked into it a little bit, you know, looked at the game again. Which I'm like, I haven't seen Consili once. Like these, these extended highlights, where where's Consili? You know, I. I went on the stats, you know, okay, one shot on target for Inter. I was just saying, bro, Consili didn't do anything. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think Frank just knows ball to a degree yeah. where he saw Consili just, just command his, his area. area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Come on, he's shouting at the defender. <laughs> so what a leader. No, I mean, that's where he excels. Eh? And Consili, don't get us strong, guys. Consili back in the day was a fantastic goalkeeper even if you go back to season one of our we, we podcast, were saying he should be called up for Italy yes. we have a theory why he fucking wasn't like yeah. and about it not being go back and check it out uh-huh. um yes but he he has a few moments in him that just make you that make you suspect him sometimes you know like, the like way he gives bought, the eh? ball away a few moments because he's such a good shot stopper and then suddenly oh, i don't know i don't want to make claim over here but yes, um, interesting stat once again. Sassuolo have their place in history, becoming only the third team to take six out of six points off of the champions of Italy. The other teams were Torino in 1994-1995, Sampdoria in 2012 and 2013, hmm. and both of them were against Juventus. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, in Zaghi's words after the loss. Okay, here we go. We started sluggish and we didn't have the right approach to the game. I'm sorry for the defeat, but credit must be given to Sassuolo for a performance of great effort and sacrifice. True. Mm-hmm. It's it's right to enjoy the Scudetto, but there are still three games to go and we have to focus. It hurts to lose and it should hurt. I already told the club that next season I want to go in with all the players I had this term, not losing a single one. Oof. Considering all the games we need to play, and the length of the season, we do need a bigger team. So let's take mm. this one by one. Um, first of all, Inzaghi is a serial winner and he hates losing. And he said it himself that he doesn't even like losing friendly. Yeah. Like, so so uh, I, I do think that he'll he'll think twice maybe about rotation for the next game. Yeah. Um, because this would have pissed him off totally, totally. And losing two games to Sassuolo in a season, like... Yeah. What do you think of about Inter needing a bigger team? Do you think they need more depth? I think I think Inter are, are the team in the league that has the best depth. <laughs> Them alongside Atalanta, their depth is crazy. Okay. Um I think it rings true because again you look at the striking department where perhaps you want higher quality depth. Perhaps in the right wing back area he doesn't just want his two options to be Dumfries and Darmian because sure in his system he can make it work but when you bring on Dumfries and and he puts together a disaster class for example then perhaps over there you need you need higher quality players that you can rotate we've often spoken that maybe they don't have a replacement for Chalanoglu if he fell injured and that the only one is Aslani and Aslani isn't really getting minutes. Mm-hmm. Perhaps mm-hmm. there should be another option over there. We know Aslani can also play in an eight. Yeah. So maybe he could be the direct replacement of Barella. And then maybe Fratesi can be the direct replacement of Mkhitaryan. It never hurts to have more players at your arsenal. Absolutely. They also had, um, you remember their defensive injury crisis. At the same time, Milan were having their yeah. defensive injury mm-hmm. crisis. So these are things that happen. Yes, and even when you look at the fact that their strikers didn't really perform, mm. uh, Sanchez took ages to come to life. Yeah, towards the end of the season only, and Arnautovic was quite woeful to be honest yeah. throughout the the season. But yeah, 
Um, that's pretty much it. Of course, Ballardini was full of praise for his players. He said that um, the club isn't accustomed to being in such a tight fight for survival, but the players are handling it really well. Sassuolo are fortunate to have people who really care, perhaps too much at some moments, he said. <laughs> he said, yeah, the club supports us and the players sent strong signals. We can do it. Mm. He believes. Ballardini believes. You have to. You have to believe. Have to. Yes. Massive three points. Massive, massive, the biggest. massive three points for them against Inter as well. Yes. So, uh huh. Sassuolo are in 19th with 29 points, just three points off of Empoli in 17th, while Inter are first drinking at the top of the table. Yeah. Now the hat can go around again. <laughs> Milan 3, Genoa 3 is oh the next God, one. Here we go. <laughs> We're going to cover the previous encounter, was a 1 0 away victory for Milan, where Giroud got a clean sheet. Um, this is the game in which Giroud had to step in goal because. Mike was in no Mike got a red card. Yes. Sport Yellow was injured. Mirante was injured. There was this whole fucking shit show and Giroud ended up keeper. Um four keepers this season, Milan. My, literally, literally. <laughs> <laughs> um Milan had Theo and Tomori back from bands after picking up um red cards and accumulation of yellows against Inter. Um, but Calabria and Musa were suspended, while Manjan, Loftus-Cheek, Kier and Jovic were injured. Long injury for some muscle fatigue, eh, Jovic? Thought it was just muscle fatigue. How the fuck is it taking that long, man? I um. just have to look into it a bit more. Starman Albert Goodmanson did not make the trip with flu symptoms. Um, left behind with Ruslan Malinowski, Bani, Maturo and former Milan man Junior Messias. So they were missing some of their key players. Messias, Malinowski, Goodmanson really standing out over there. Absolutely. Three of their standout players. And Messias has had a really tough season with injuries. He really point. has. Like he, really he was has. hardly ever injured with Milan, it's if true. I recall correctly. It's no, true. Never like this, at least. It's Probably true. because he was sharing every minute with Salah Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a strange atmosphere in this thrilling encounter as Milan Skurva sat in silence to protest their season. And then, and obviously, like Jake correctly mentioned, the managerial situation as well. And then they walked out 10 minutes from time, probably thinking Milan got away with that win. <laughs> uh-huh. um, 4-2-3-1 formation for Pioli's men in one of his final showdowns in San Siro. Uh, Sportiello in goal, backline of Florenzi, Gabbia, Tomori and Theo. Double pivot of Reinders and Ben Nasser. Leao out on the left, Chukwez out on the right, Pulisic playing behind Giroud. I saw this lineup and told Jake um, we're going to absolutely kill Genoa over here. That's not really what happened. 3 yeah. 5 2 formation for Gilardino's men with Martinez in goal and the back line of Voliaco, De Winter, and Vasquez. Spence out on the right, Martin out on the left, and the midfield three of Friendrup, Badel, and Thorsby with Tretegui starting alongside Ecoban up front. So Genoa were the ones that opened the scoring in the fifth minute as Retegui sent Sportiello the wrong way from the spot to make it 1-0. The penalty was awarded after Tomori tripped up Voliaco in the box. Um, This was Retegui's first goal since end February. 1-0 Genoa. Pulisic hit the post with an excellent effort in the 13th minute and Martinez pulled off a couple of great saves before Milan equalised in the 45th minute through Florenzi, who headed in a peach of a cross by Chukweza. His last goal was on the 8th of May 2022 against Verona. Whoa. And then after halftime, Pioli's magical team talks. No? <laughs> 48th minute, 2 1 Genoa. <laughs> Voliaco's early cross was brilliantly headed in by Ecoban as he beat Gabbia in the air. Voliaco was really, really involved in this game. Every 50 50, he was there like a fucking animal, man. Won the penalty, got the assist over here. Ecoban's presence in the box. He's a strong, strong boy, man. He is, and I'm really happy for him because because he turned his season around totally. um, The Genoa fans were really criticizing him for ages. Mm -hmm. And uh, now he looks like a player who's got a lot of, um, you know, he can cause problems running at the defense and also in the air. Um, Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Uh Fiorentina penalty, 84th minute, steps up. Oh, Ooh, goal! That's just a belt run. Just what a what a goal! Just underneath the keeper. Well placed. Great stuff. Yes, fantastic. So, 48th minute, Ecoban equalizes. Sorry, 
makes it 2-1 to Genoa with that header. 72nd minute, Milan equalized through Gabbia, who headed in a Florenzi corner very well, getting his third goal since rejoining the season. Third goal being in all competitions. This is his second in Serie A. Hmm. Um, and then three minutes later, Giroud volleyed into the far corner after a brilliant cross by Pulisic. Really put his foot through that one. That is a trademark Giroud goal for mm-hmm. Milan. Mm-hmm. You'd think Milan had it done. You'd think, okay, <laughs> thank guys, you gave me a fright over there. All right, I can I can calm down now. 87th minute. It was a really simple long ball down the wing that absolutely caught everyone off guard from the Milan team. Um, Landed to Thorsby who hit a square ball that was fumbled over the line by Chow. Tomori tried to pass it out but it connected with Chow. Retegui was putting pressure on and it just went over the line. Um, can't put too much blame on Mm. Chow over there. It's literally just... Nothing you can do there. eh? If it weren't him it would have been Retegui. Uh huh. Milan, bro, winless in six in all competitions. Terrible spell after. Um, from January onwards, Milan were really turning their season around. We were starting to say maybe purely not out. The statistics were showing Milan actually had more points than they did at that stage of the season than the season they won the Scudetto. Everything was looking like, okay, these players are starting to gel. The project is starting to, you know. But then all of a sudden, season turned round on its head as Milan got knocked out against Roma and the Europa League. Mm-hmm. And then straight after that, losing against Inter in their own stadium. And Inter lifting, the tr- well, not lifting the trophy that night, but... Celebrating winning so, the second Di star. Marco tattooed the, the date of the derby and the, and the Scudetto trophy. Congratulations, I mean, Demarco. Congratulations. Maybe history. Demarco, you should tattoo some blonde. Over. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not gonna talk about it. There's players here. Let's go. <laughs> That was a hilarious comment on our YouTube section but from Kyle. What else can we say about Inter? Proceeds to Rose their hairline. <laughs> Mkhitaryan balding yeah. Carlos Augusto balding <laughs> DeMarco we know what you're doing yeah. amazing um, one one thing I found interesting um, is Genoa's approach once again um, of course you, you'd expect a low block yeah. going into a game like this mm-hmm. um, if Genoa are going to attack you you'd expect them to go on Chukwes and Florenzi's side mm. that is not what Genoa did at all all of their attacks, 95% of their attacks, I would say, came down Leo and Theo's side. Catching them out. Catching them out, totally. Catching them out. Going them Look them at the goals. Look where they out. came. They all came from that side. All of them. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. So, so imagine, imagine choosing to attack down Theo's side over Florenzi's side. These are... Because we often talk about like these managers don't have enough experience. Okay. But these young managers, some of them have balls bro like for Gilardino to go up against Milan and to just decide look I'm gonna try this out they're often attacking so let's let's mm. bait them and catch them out on that left hand side down Milan's left hand side man yeah, well, I know the, the and they are. double world class side literally it's called uh-huh. but but yes it could be the case maybe that um, they do push up more on that side I, I guess that's yeah. it right that um, it didn't help Milan at all that Tomori was particularly erratic this game yeah. he was rushing out he was clumsy from the get go and when mm-hmm. you when you have a start to a game like that you're just destined for for a disaster it's going to yeah. be like mentally you're shaken like and it's going to be a long day for you at the office um, Absolutely. Three minutes in, what was it? He was only three minutes in, no? I uh-huh, have three, four three, minutes yeah. in. The penalty was scored in the fifth. Yeah. Um, reckless, reckless by him. Uh-huh. It's always been his problem, huh? Since he joined. He's a fantastic centre back, don't worry. Brilliant centre back. But this rush of blood to the head he gets, he reminds me of um of Romero, man. Who's at Ooh, Spurs now? Uh-huh, when it comes through. to this random rush of blood he uh-huh. gets to the head. Like he's he's not a clean and tidy uh-huh. centre back. It's true. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, he's, I know. He's more mean. like he's not Grinta, exactly yeah. Grinta, aggressive. Some of his 
he's very smart with where he positions himself there are certain you see certain goal line clearances certain interceptions certain tackles as well are really really good i don't mean to say obviously he's not mm, a, a, a mm. gifted center back he's not tidy at all you know um very but good he's, in the air. he's very good in the air but he's erratic at yes, times yes, man yes, yes. and that's something that that comes and then it, it, it calms down with experience absolutely you look at ramos in the earlier stages of his career he was erratic towards the latter stages of his career he was aggressive and commanding mm. that's the difference you learn how to transfer that into a Mancini is another brilliant example of that. It's true. Mancini is another great example. And if you look at Tamori, granted, he's 26 years old. He's not the youngest. But how long has he been starting full seasons? Yeah. Not yeah. that long. So uh, maybe, you know, in two or three years' time, he would have mm-hmm. ironed this this issue out. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but some more coaching, you know, some more experience. Yeah. A tactical thing that I noticed. Because mm-hmm. obviously, nowadays, since... The hashtag purely out train. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're on it. True, true. And, <laughs> and, 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 and all that. You kind of make observations. And <laughs> you start seeing everything. But did you notice purely changing formation after going one up in the 75th he, he, minute? He just removed the midfield. He fucking... He took out Chukweze and brought on Chow. Okay? So, he brought on an extra defender... And he lost the midfield. Yes. So essentially, it, this created a huge gap in the middle that invited all that pressure from Genoa. I don't know. 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 In game management was always the struggle. No, ah, but but <laughs> Milan have the most substitute goals this season. Um, yes, but they're all man for man substitutions. B- bring on Jovic for Giroud. Bring yeah. on Chukweze yeah. for Pulisic. There were certain occasions where he went two up front. Giroud knocks it down for Jovic. Yay! You know? It's true. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't know how much we can... It's tr- spot on. That that was weird. The fact that mm. he just removed the midfield towards the end it was totally weird. But however, I, I must say, for example, one talking point from this game that we haven't even addressed yet is Leo, man. Uh-huh. Leo, uh-huh. once uh-huh. again. Uh-huh. You see this paragraph here? Yeah. That's all about Leo. That's Leo. He was wearing the armband this game again, right? Whoa. Or was he? Florenzi might have been wearing it. Um, I'm not sure who was wearing it. Wait, I have the screenshot here. Is there a C anywhere? No, there isn't a C anywhere. Okay. No, the... of, of course, Theo would ah, be wearing Theo, it. Ah, Theo, of course. Though. He was back. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yes, so uh, for me, Leo got, got booed off this game. Absolutely, like um, mm-hmm. clear that, it, that the boos were directed to him. Uh-huh. Walked straight down the tunnel and didn't even acknowledge the the fans yeah. at the end of the game. Yeah. Um. Granted, the curva were in there, but um. You know, there are other people who paid to see money, and you were the captain last week. Mm. This is how a captain acts. This is how it, a captain composes it doesn't himself. End there. It feels like we're picking on him, but it's I I love Leo and I love the type of player he is. I, he's he's a unicorn in football terms, man, Leo, because it's it's so uncommon to have a player. Uh. So bloody good that he looks like a different species on the pitch. But I'm sorry, man. He has to he has to mature still. He needs to grow up. He seems a little bit too affected by by criticism. He seems a little bit he too... He tweeted, you know, he tweeted after. What he, he tweeted. <laughs> what the hell did he say? He's always tweeting, man. Um, this is the translation. Mm. That's a good one, huh? <laughs> Thank you for existing. There are people who do not know the meaning. It's much more than a passion, it's a religion. And fucking... Who replied, man? Who retweeted or whatever these kids do nowadays? <laughs> Cancelo. Cancelo. It's like, it's like, Leo no, brother, Leo, Leo. <laughs> It's like, you don't know what I know. <laughs> you don't know what I know. Uh. I know that... Milan have a world-class talent at their hands who has been slapped with a release clause of 175 million euros. A player who... Is the highest at earner. At times... So, is the highest earner for the club. At times, there were seasons where I wouldn't have blamed him if he left. Uh-huh. I wouldn't have blamed him. And, and he stayed and he renewed when no one thought he would. When there was a time where people say, ah, because Leao thinks he's bigger than the club. no. Never. He's always stayed loyal to Milan. He has he wants a career at Milan. 
he's there and he can still, he has time to go down as a club legend. But what am I seeing right now in front of my very eyes? Something I've always noticed is the way that he walks around the pitch. We said, okay, you know what? He's still young. A, attitude might not be perfect yet. B, maybe purely is asking him to preserve his energy. Yes, or to lure his opponents into a false sense of security. And then just times. take off like Speedy Gonzalez. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? But he has been nothing recently, but totally, absolutely invisible. And instead of playing to his strengths in order to help the team in a moment where the team is struggling, like, okay, there's nothing to play for, but there's a lot to play for. I want Milan to finish second, not third or fourth mm-hmm. or, or, or fifth. I want the new manager to be looking at Milan and say, okay, this is that, that's how I want Milan to play. You know what I mean? Totally invisible, not playing to his strengths, taking shots from everywhere, trying too much on the ball. And then he gets substituted and he walks down, goes straight to the dressing room, doesn't acknowledge the fans at all. That is the behavior of a player that's on his way out. You know, the problem is he must be fucking frustrated because who in the right mind at the moment is going to pay 175 million to have him play for their team? Mention one team that would do that right now because there isn't a fucking team in the world, man. No, his release clause won't be matched for sure and not with how he's playing. But the Euros are coming up and you never know. One good performance in the Euros and maybe someone bites. Um, Again, yes, there is is this kind of thing that, okay, we're we're fully aware that the season's over. You know, we're we're fully aware for Milan. These last few games are a formality more than anything else. Um, However, look at Florenzi, man. Look at Florenzi. You heard what Kendrick said. Said someone try tell Florenzi that this uh-huh. game doesn't mean anything. That <laughs> Florenzi is there fucking <laughs> celebrating. Yes, man. Yes. That's what, that's what you want yes. to see, man. Even even if even if you don't mean it. Even if you don't put it on. Put it, put it on, on, man. Give them put what the, they want. I'm what are you gullible doing, as man? fuck, yeah. man. Kiss the badge, <laughs> yes. Allah. Pump your chest a bit. It's it's as simple as that. He's easily picked on because of his demeanor. It's as simple as that. Um, it doesn't even bother. It's the walking. It doesn't annoy me as much when Milan are are tied or or when Milan are winning. That's okay to me. But if you're losing to Winter, Winter. for example, and they're passing the ball <laughs> at the back around you, playing Torello piggy in the middle, and you're there like like you're in break eating your lunch with the sandwich, half heartedly playing a game. No, no, it's it's yes, it's he needs to he needs to mature a little bit I and rant, rant over. Purely spoke after the game. They asked him like, like what the hell? Like you took out Leao? Like like what 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 was your thought process like there? He's like, to be honest, Leao didn't show me the things I needed to see. I know that Okafor is a way more direct player. We needed a goal, so I brought him on. That's what he said. Chew on that, Leao. Mm. Chew on that because you can't be the superstar of the team if there are players that are going to be more effective than you. It's as simple as that. You are not the superstar if there are players that are more effective mm-hmm. than you. His place isn't a guarantee. He's not the star of the team. And he's still 24 years old. He needs to work for it. He needs to work for let's, it. Let's also say, though, that um, a motivated Leo on his day is by far the star of the team, right? Yes, 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 of yes, course, yes. yes absolutely. Okay, so we're in agreement. Um I believe it was when he was substituted that Milan came back into the game. I, I believe Milan believe scored so. two goals after Leao was removed. Uh, was it two goals or, or one? I believe yeah, so. I can't yeah. find it, bro. Um, I've become really bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> ah, here it is, 67th. Yes, yep, Gabi yep, Angeria, yep. two goals yep. after he was subbed out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But anyway. Um, Milan search for a new manager. Hmm. So, no Petegi. Lopetegui no, is out. He seems like he's going to be joining turns West Ham. out, never that close to being done. Remember last episode, uh, I said that maybe uh, what I think is that probably it was never actually that uh, close to being done. Apparently, there was an, an inside scoop from Saint Premelan saying that he he never actually well, it was never actually that close. Lopetegui. Oh. It was more of a rumor than I anything see. else. Yeah, interesting. Um, but yeah, he's 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 off to West Ham. David Moyes is out for West Ham, and he'll be joining in his stead. Um, now, it's, it seems like it's going to be a Portuguese coach, and it's either going to be Conceição, who has been the manager of Porto for the past few years. Um, he has just renewed his contract 
but he does have a clause within his contract that allows him to leave when he wants. Um, and then there's Fonseca, which is a bit more distant from, from Milan, from what I've heard at the moment. Mm. Motta remains in conversation, as well as Deserbi, but Deserbi has a release clause, and it's unheard of that Milan would trigger a release clause for a manager, uh-huh. right? Um, when was the last time Milan brought in a manager who has as many trophies as Conceição does? Granted, it's in the Portuguese league, mm. but think about that. Usually they're... Like, you look at even the legendary ones, Ancelotti, mm. Sacchi, uh-huh. Cappello, they were all kind of understudies yeah. right, of someone. Even Pioli, now Pioli mm. coming in, didn't really have a trophy to his name. Did True. You? So it's weird bringing in someone who has had success, so and, and quite dominant success mm-hmm. as well, because Conceição, granted, it's with Porto in um, the Portuguese league, but, um, but yeah, I mean... Culturally, Portuguese the Portuguese league, league isn't very an easy similar. one to Definitely win. Definitely not. There's, There's Benfica, Benfica Sporting yeah, yeah, yeah. Lisbon, and all and all yeah. these guys. It's not. It's, it's not easy. And, at and all. I would say that it's only just outside the top five leagues. Mm. So it's probably the best non-top. Five yeah, leagues. yeah. I would. I would agree with you there. Um, I am Conceição in. Conceição. I am Conceição. Apart from Deserbi Motta, like the obvious mm-hmm. ones. If it's not either of those two, Conceição. It doesn't bother me, the shout of Conceição at all. Give me someone with balls, bro. Just give me someone. He, he's gonna petrify the living fuck out of our entire team. And come on. Oh, because we, I keep doing this in this episode, you know. Just uh, I keep imitating uh, everyone going, oh, oh, look at me. <laughs> Everyone's like, because Milan need an offensive coach. Why? Why? If Milan have had absolutely no problem scoring this season, but their problem has been conceding goals. They've conceded so many. I'm going to tell you how many goals Milan conceded this season. 42. How many 42. Bologna conceded, bro? Bologna, 27. Yeah. Juve, 27. Atalanta, 38. What about Inter? They also had a diff- 19. injury crisis, bro. 19. Torino, 31. Fiorentina, 39. Milan do not need an offensive coach. Milan needs someone that's going to solve this issue of conceding goals. Yes, Milan need balance, I think. Yes, The strikers can do their thing. Bring in Zegze and, and, and let them work their magic. Yeah. But anyway. um, yes, Conceição. Let's see, hopefully. Yeah. Um, if not him, Motta. If not him, Conte. <laughs> but apparently you heard Pioli um, might be going to Napoli. Napoli. That's a no-brainer. No, absolutely. That's a no-brainer absolutely. over there. Absolutely. Company man. Um, probably will get on with De Laurentiis. Bold plays a 4-3-3, plays bring a 4-3-3. him in. <laughs> yes, that's it, that's it, bring me in. ADL is <laughs> writing up the contract right now. What, he's bold and plays a 4-3-3? <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> are in second on 71 points. 71 points? No, no, 71 points. You know, you could call it an okay season. We just have a taste of silver. Domestically, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, imagine next season. You know, we're Milan are struggling to make top four. You know, they're uh-huh, like, we'd, uh-huh. we'd look back at the, the season case and last be like, season. Ah, exactly. We'd look at the season and be like, ah, that season with Pioli, how much better it was. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it's all about yeah. what you compare. Oh, for sure, <laughs> comparison is a thief of joy, gentlemen. There you go. And ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You may just say it like that, ladies. <laughs> Genoa in 12th on 43 points. Genoa also have a fantastic record, by the way, against the top teams. They've held Inter, mm-hmm. they've killed Roma, I believe they've held Atalanta, um, they have held Milan, I think they held Fiorentina as well. A lot of holding, a lot Definitely. of holding by, yeah. by Genoa. It's true, they've been, they've been very good when it comes to... They're another Robin Hood, you know? Yeah. Um, shall we move on to the next? Yes, yes. The next is Monza 2, Lazio 2, dude. Um, Lazio thought they had it all done and dusted towards the end with a late um, goal. We'll, I'll run you through it properly, don't worry. Mm-hmm. Um, let's go with the formations. We have a 4 2 3 1 for Monza with Di Gregorio on goal, Birindelli and Kyriakopoulos on the flanks, with Itzo and Mari as a centre back partnership. Warren Bondo and Matteo Pessina were the midfield double pivot with Colpani and Zerbin out wide and Valentin Carboni um, playing behind Milan Juric. <clears throat> that 
call Pani Carboni Zerbin, man. Delicious. This is 90s, man. Literally, 90s football. Literally, 90s football. Some, someone get them a kappa jacket. Yeah, honestly, honestly. Someone man. get them a kappa jacket and some trackies with their socks. They're, they're above so them. much fun to watch, honestly. And I don't use this word often. They are wicked. They, <laughs> <laughs> what they are is retro, bro. Retro, man. Retro. Retro. Three, four, two, one for two doors men. Um, as two door continues to explore his options at Lazio and twinkle and play over mm. here. Uh, Mandas was in goal with Hisai, Romagnoli, and Patrick at the back. Zakani as the full back, um, as the wing back, sorry, and Marisic on the other side with Kamada and Gwenduzi in the middle. Luis Alberto and Felipe Anderson playing behind Giro Immobile, who got the start ahead of um, Castellanos because Castellanos had an operation. Uh-huh. In his tooth. In his tooth? Painful shit, I man. Imagine, Painful but, shit. But, yeah, weird one. They say the two worst pains are <laughs> ear pain and tooth pain. Shout out to my homies with ear pain and tooth pain. Yes. Hope we hope you feel better, guys. Yes. Mario Hila was the only absentee for Lazio. Um, a big absentee over there. Massive because Hila is very mm. good. And they Hila, needed, la, how good. Hila, la, how good. They needed a good center back as well to deal with the likes of Jurich, man. Someone who's, who's not afraid to get stuck uh-huh. in, you know. And when you look at, you know, Patrick, okay, he's got his stuff together this season. But Hisai was playing as a makeshift center back. And Romagnoli this season hasn't been as good as he... He was out he injured was, for a yes. while. Um, Gagliardini, Churia... Um, Andrea Carboni, Daniel Maldini, Machine um, were all out injured for Monza. Itzo was also um, not fully fit, but he started. And Danny Mota was not fully fit either. In fact, I don't think he featured. Now, uh, did he come on? He might have he come, did on. come on. Okay, he did come but on. he was just not fully fit uh. to start. Yeah. In fact, I think he he came on eventually quite late. Uh, he had been injured. He had been injured. Yes. So, um, match events. So, first of all, the reverse fixture was a 1-1 thanks to an Immobile penalty and a Gagliardini goal. Hmm. Um, Chiro opened the scoring in this one, uh, meaning he's done it twice against Monza this season. He scored capitalizing on a rebound after Kamada decided to launch it from quite far out. Um, Di Gregorio had a stunning save, mm. um, but he sa- could only save it under the crossbar and he was unfortunate that it fell to Chiro Immobile, yeah. who still, if there's one thing Immobile will never lose till his old age, till he's in a bloody, you know, nursing home, is his, his positional awareness, yes, man. man. He's yes. top notch when it comes uh-huh. to that. So he put himself exactly where he needed to be and he smacked it in. Um, Juric scored in the 73rd minute, a very rare goal with his foot. I can't mm. remember the last goal I've, I've seen from Juric that came with his foot. This probably was on our career mode with Salernitana where we snapped him up on a free. Yeah, probably, bro. That was so much fun, by the way. Mm. Um, Vecino scored um, Lazio's second goal after intercepting a back pass from Monza's Giulio Donati. This was a reckless pass oh. if I've ever seen one. Passing it into no man's land. But it's almost even... like the defender disappeared as well. Uh-huh. He, but Akpak, bro, he saw that the, the, it, it was going to be too short. Why, why does he keep backing up, expecting the ball to get to him? Obviously, there's a runner in behind. Yeah. Like, absolutely, the pass was dreadful, but help a brother out and that yeah, attacked absolutely. the ball. Absolutely. And then he lost his footing when he noticed the Lazio yeah. player coming through. And then Monza's equalizer came deep into stoppage time with a towering trademark header from the big Bosnian bastard Juric um, on a lovely cross from Mattia Pessina. Bro, that was a lovely, lovely goal. He had three Amazing. Lazio men around him. There was, I thought there was no way this guy's going to get the ball. But then you see at the beginning, you know, when you see Patrick and Juric shaking hands, you know, this is the size difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really... You really see how big Juric is. He's he can massive. For, he's, he's massive. He's ginormous. Yeah. I want to know what happened over here. With Zakani. From the 15th minute, Zakani uh-huh. got a yellow card. He was subbed off for yes. Cesale by the 32nd. Cesale so, and then got a yellow card three minutes after off. coming on. Uh-huh. Bro. So, so Tudor thought that Zakani was very nervous this game. Okay. And could be because he's playing him as a wing back and Zakani can't defend. Like. Uh-huh. <laughs> he took him out because he was on a yellow and he said that he was on a yellow and a half to do our set so I had to take ah, him okay. out and he brought on um, Chasale who's been pretty Ho- bad horrible all season, season. He's, yes, been he's been shit he's been all bad. season three minutes up on entry <laughs> Chasale gets booked immediately so now you've ah. got your centre back on a yellow card for the rest of the game uh-huh. um, a bit of a fumble there by Tudor I think 
no. a kind of let down by by uh, Chazal yeah, absolutely well, but... yes um Bondo and Carboni missed two open headers in the first half. If it was any, if there was anyone who deserved to win this game, it was Monza. Monza I agree. Who, who, who I don't agree. have anything to play for, but they're playing pretty well mm-hmm. anyway. Um, this was Immobile's first goal since February. Wow. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, to door, one point I want to make over here. Yeah, seems to be doing two things at the same time. Mm. On the one hand, he's experimenting and he's kind of going through a preseason. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, he's not playing certain players who I would expect him to to give a run. The okay. likes of Rovella, uh, the likes of Pellegrini. True. Why are you bringing on Pedro? Why are you? St- I know you. You know you start your best players. There's still a mission over here that needs to be accomplished. It's you true. He I is mean? neglecting but, certain. But uh, some players, I feel, uh, are being a bit neglected. Like if you if you're really gonna Isaacson, stay next season, who's been good. Isaacson is another one. You bring on Pedro instead of Isaacson. Pedro struggled a bit this season. I mean, granted, probably in training he stands out. Pedro, because Pedro is Pedro was a world class player. Mm-hmm. You know, so he probably stands out in training. But if you're looking long term, if you're looking on br- to bring some energy, some flair into That's the game, it. bring on Isaacson. He, uh-huh. He's he might be your solution next season. Mm-hmm. Try him out. I also find. Zakanyi left wing back just wrong. Yeah. Like if if there is one player this season, not all this season, over the past two, three years, that has turned Lazio into a team that's capable of grabbing more goals down the they've they've really struggled with wingers until they found Zakanyi. Mm-hmm. They found Zakanyi, Lazio always had a problem. With having good wingers. Philip Anderson, always streaky. I forgot who they had before. Um, Nani. <laughs> Nani. Uh-huh. Um, the star in Venice and then. Yeah. Um, but now they have Zakani, who is amazing. He's he's fantastic. And and, and he really turns it up down that left hand side. He charges for deal. He's an example. Deal. Play him to his strength. Uh uh-huh. local Italian you should love him, like kind yeah. of thing. But he's he's Playing him totally out of position. Another weird thing he did, bro, was he took out... And like he's starting Anderson, who's yes, fucking who's out. off to Brazil. But then the thing is, Anderson is the best dribbler on the team. He's the best flair player, I guess. Mm. Um, you need to play him to try to get you the, the mm. victory. I'm all right with starting him, but then give the young ones a, a run out, you know. Um, he took out Kamada and Luis Alberto at the same time. And brought on Vecino and Cataldi. Took out all the How imagination, like all the creativity. Yeah, it was it was really weird. Um, and even starting his as a, as a centre back, I don't know. This was a bit weird from Tudor. Uh-huh. And he spoke after the game, and I have his um, his quotes here. He said, um, "Where does the quote start?" Speaking to, okay, Zakani had a yellow card um, and a half. He was so tense. He could have been given a red. The red was on the table. Today, we should have and could have done better. A team that must do more than what they did today. I have to analyze this deeply. This is the match I liked the least, both in attack and in defense. Also, from a mental point of view, Mons are tough. They're a good team, but winning wouldn't be right. But winning wouldn't be right. Ah, as in we didn't deserve to uh, win. Let's take this point and prepare ourselves as best as we can for the final three games. Okay. Um, he said that anything can happen towards the end of the game, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that's it. He commented on the poor performance of Philip Anderson and others. Today, okay. many players were subpar. Some were forced. I made substitutions today. I tried to remove... I tried not to remove the least bad ones. So he said that everyone was, was bad, basically. Okay. And he just, was just taking out the ones who weren't as bad uh-huh. as the rest. Today, there were many subpar players. They have to perform well with a cl- clear mind. We should have done better. So, yes, he didn't like the defensive phase. He didn't like it when they had the ball. He didn't like anything. And in quotes, I'm very sad and angry. But on the other side, it's very clear in my head what I have to do. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's got a game plan. It's it's a... Uh... It's a missed opportunity for Lazio, let's put it that way, because they were in decent form, three wins on the trot. A victory over here would have put them just two points behind their arch rivals in Roma. And suddenly, it seems to be an okay season for Lazio. They're in a position where they can push as much as possible with the final three games to go, especially if Roma slip up, which is very possible with their schedule. They can slip in and take their place or if Atalanta slip up you know at least put themselves in the equation um 
but I really didn't see like the urgency from the players. I think Tudor is absolutely right in saying that his players let him down. They didn't have a good game at all. But to be honest, is it just the players? Because it doesn't seem like this system is totally set up to play to the strengths of this current Lazio team. That's a question. Now, of course, let him try new things so yeah. that next season he has a clearer picture. You remember our whole thing of, okay, what the hell is Motta doing with Bologna? Yeah. Okay, he's figuring it out. Fucking he figured it out. So, but it doesn't seem to be working as of yet. But now he'll have a full preseason yeah. with the team and, and hopefully it will get better. But that's for that's them. exactly the thing. Like it's weird why he, he he's so adamant on playing this three at the back formation, but then he brings on the players who can make an impact this season. Uh-huh. So weird, just play weird. them in their formation, man, a formation that suits them. If you want to play Pedro and if you want to play Zakani, you know like, like uh-huh. Zakani obviously gonna play him. But play him in his best position. Yeah, yeah. Play Pedro on the other side. Fuck it. Don't bring him on as uh-huh. a makeshift midfielder. You Did- know though did yeah. you hear um, what? What's his name? What his dream is, Lotito? What's his dream? No, not, not what his dream is, but what he envisions. What, what does Lotito? God knows what he envisions. <laughs> Let me just look at him. Giovanni Simeone and the Nine. Simeone and the Nine. Simeone and the Nine. It's been mentioned for some time, but now there's talks. There have been talks that Immobile might go to Napoli, like to be a sub striker yeah, or whatever. Um, and there's there. talks. Uh-huh. He's from Giro, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. But there's um there's a whole swap deal that that is being rumored and 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 talked about. If I'm Lotito, I take that in a heartbeat. Granted, the Immobile story would would come to an end, would conclude beautiful story. But but, this, but there's only one winner over here, and and that's that's Lazio because they're getting Simeone who had his incredible season at Hellas Verona, coached by Tudor. Yes. So, reunite There's them. that, and then there's also the fact that you're just investing in younger talent and it's the end of a cycle. No, with Giroz, mm. a sad thing, but but cycles come to an end. Absolutely, yes. Um, Giovanni Simeone nowadays, 28 years old, still a decent age for a striker. It's go time. Yeah, it's go, go time. time. Now, now you start. He had like a good run with Napoli in the Champions League doing this and that. He's obviously not going to sniff that starting spot as long as yeah. Ozyman is, is around. So it depends who Napoli bring in now. Um, he has two good options. Stay at Napoli or go to Lazio. It's not too bad for him. Yeah. Um, Lazio are in seventh place with 56 points, while Monza are in 11th place with 45 points. Torino nil, Bologna nil. Congratulations, Juric, once again for your ninth nil nil of the season. <laughs> um, previous encounter was Bologna 2, Torino nil. Uh, Bologna already guaranteed historic European qualification after 22 years, but still wanted to lock down that Champions League spot, but had Adama, Sao Mauro and Lewis Ferguson out for the season. Beukema and Tamez sat out bands while Gigi, Shores, Sazonov and Ginetis were injured. 3-4-1-2 formation for Juric's men with Vanya in goal and the back line Careful of... the wire, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Vanya in goal and the back line of Mazina, Bongiorno and Voivoda. Rick Rod out on the left, Bellanova out on the right and the double pivot of Illich and Ricci with Vlasic playing behind Zapata and Sanabria. It was a 4-1-4-1 formation for Bologna <laughs> or, a, you know, 2 7 <laughs> Every time. Skorupski, goal, a back line of Posh, Lukumi, Calafiori and Christensen. Freuler as the uh, regista with Indoya, Fabian, Abisher and Salamakers in midfield with Zerg Zay up front. Now, whilst there weren't any goals, um, there were a few opportunities. Sanabria rattled the frame of the goal with his powerful header in the 17th minute as the follow-up by Zapata was saved amazingly by Skorupski, what a game Skorupski had in this game. <laughs> um, Skorupski pulled off another masterful save in the 66th minute on Illich, as once again Zapata failed to convert the follow-up, this time due to his own player getting in the way, that player was Sanabria. Mm-hmm. Um, Torino did have the, the better chances than Bologna in this game. Um, I think Torino did a great job to defend. It's not like they got a nil-nil over here because they weren't trying or because they were sitting back. It, it was simply the case that 
Bologna have a close to impenetrable defense. And on their day, so do Torino. Yeah, with, yeah, with, with, with that yeah. Ivan Juric side. These are two teams that, you know, we, we just said. One of them conceded. Torino um, only conceded 31 goals this season. Where is it? Uh-huh, 31 goals this season. Whereas Bologna only conceded 27 goals this season. So these are two managers that know how to organize a defense, right? And as well, individually very talented defenders. Um Obviously, Buongiorno for for uh, Torino as well. Even Adam Mazzina was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. This game. So I don't think it was a lack of trying, but I think it was quite an even affair, to be honest, in this game. Absolutely. Um, one shot on target for each team. Um, didn't miss much of you if you yeah. missed this game. <laughs> to be honest with you, um, it seems like uh uh-huh, Bologna are really scraping through this last part of the season. Mm. Eh? It's almost like the top games they show up and they absolutely impress everyone. But now they're they're clashing a little bit. Here we go with the next few games. Tell and me. and this is who they have left. Please. Okay. Next game, Napoli away. The game after, Juve home. Last game of the season, Genoa away. So here we're looking at two victories and then a draw to Genoa. For Bologna, <laughs> <laughs> the way things are going. No, that's tough. That's a tough run. That man. like, I but fear they do that... turn up in these big games. Yeah, you fear that they'll drop out because Roma and Atalanta are on an absolute fucking mission. Juve have got it done if they beat Salernitana. It's Bologna, tough. Eh? Bologna have the one competition advantage. Remember, that's as it. Well. That's it. Yeah, that's it. But they have very tough fixtures. Yeah, I don't know. Um... It's tight, that's the beauty of exactly. this podcast. We don't stop when we find out who won the exactly. league because there's so much more. Um, did you notice Torino's kit? Of course you did. It was Torino's fucking kit drop was gorgeous. Dead, gorgeous. Obviously, um, it was the the anniversary of the Superga tragedy that unfortunately killed the Grande Torino team. It was the 75th anniversary of that. That was the entire national team of Italy, by the way, as well. Yep, mm-hmm. and... The creator of not Gazzetta dello Sport. Ah, one of yes. One of um, was it Gazzetta? It could be. I'm not sure. One of them. Um, there, there was uh, someone involved in newspapers. More, well, not more importantly, but but more f- famously, the the entire Torino team, the entire Italy national team back then, man. Um, on a plane back after a cup winners cup game against Benfica, fans waiting for them. They're like, we can't see anything. It's foggy. Turns out even the pilot was struggling like it was a disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, 75th anniversary for that. So they were a beautiful kit to honor that. The only thing that I wasn't a massive fan of is the way the sponsor looks. Ah, it faded. Like, it faded mm-hmm. and, and they have an ugly sponsor, right? But Vanya's kit, the black one, the sponsor didn't show at all and it looks fucking sick. Um, go check it out, guys. Torino, back in February... Juric said this, we've done an extraordinary job. Bro, February has been a word in this episode. It really has been a word. Um, Juric said this in February, we've done an extraordinary job. If we go to Europe, I'll stay at Toro. Otherwise, I'll leave. (laughs) (laughs) So, is bro acoustic? I have a theory. <laughs> this might be his last season yes, at Torino. Sure, yes, yes, yes. This is the longest he stayed at one club, three seasons. Um, longest before that was to stay at Verona, where he had two seasons. Wow. Uh-huh, he's not a, I wonder if he's married and for how long. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, Typically, he had, he had previously complained about of a lack of investment from Cairo. He has recently seen some investment in the team, Duvan Zapata. Ah, it's been a bit better, but it's let's... been a bit better. But he said, "If I'm not fighting, if if I'm not in Europe, then what the fuck am I doing here?" To be fair, he has a strained relationship with Cairo, as does everyone in the world. Um, do you remember they came to blows in a parking lot? Once yes, there was a bro. Video yes, that had yes, gone yes. Viral. So, uh uh-huh, three seasons. The fact that he's given them three seasons, I think Cairo is lucky. Replaced Bellotti. Exactly. That was it. Exactly. <laughs> He's right, mm. you know, I mean, don't punch him, you know, I mean, who did he tell once that he's going to slit his throat? He... Recently, bro, yeah. like a couple he's of, rich. he got suspended, no <laughs> other... <laughs> he's mental. Um, I Italiano? Think so. Yes, I, I think, think so. Italiano. I think so. 
Um, I do hope Yuri stays in Italy, though, because he's a very promising coach. But it seems that the teams above him are mm-hmm. pretty sorted. So for an upgrade, he might need to go overseas. But yes, whoever is getting Yuri is getting a very pragmatic coach, but a very solid coach. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. I, I think his his goal is to be in Europe, right? I, I see him, if Gilardino, for example, if Gilardino goes to Fiorentina or... or some or or he upgrades in some in some way. I think Genoa would be a good team for Juric to coach. But if he wants European football along, away, along that level, be... but who's who? Like I don't think he has a place at Atalanta, Roma, Lazio. Maybe Lazio to a degree, and in the future, it's more philosophy wise. He doesn't seem to match. Eh, ah, that's teams. it. That's yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's not gonna go to Fiorentina. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like I don't think. Fiorentina would more see him go overseas. Yeah. There are like Marseille who like hiring uh-huh. a manager uh-huh. from, from Italy. Um, uh, I just want to re-highlight the statistic, right? The 31 goals scored and the 31 goals conceded. The 31 goals scored in 35 matches is the 17th best in Serie A this season. So essentially the fourth worst. Um the 31 goals conceded is the fourth best this season. So two completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Fourth best and fourth worst. That's, Both that's 31 wild, goals. Yeah. Again, the stuff. duality of the man. The duality of man. Um, Bologna, on the other hand, I don't think there's much to add over there um, to cover both teams equally, but they have these three games upcoming. We know what Bologna are capable of doing. These are three blockbuster fixtures. You said they have the one game advantage, sorry, the one competition advantage. Okay, but so do Napoli. You will just have that final, and so do Genoa. So it's a tough run, and they're going to be against fresh legs who are each hungry for something out of the season. Uh, yeah. I, yes, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I just agreed <laughs> with you on the croak instead. <laughs> <laughs> Torino on 10th on 47 points, whilst Bologna are in 4th on 64 points. Brilliant. The next game we're going to be talking about is Hellas Verona 2, Fiorentina 1. Crazy. 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 This was probably, not probably, this was the upset of the week. Well, no, it's a swallow. It's a swallow. But they were hungover, you know, but so does that, yeah. is that as, as, yeah. as impressive? So Hellas Verona were playing a 4 2 3 1 formation with Montepo in goal. Chen Tonze was on the on the right as the right back. I forgot he was French. Chen Tons. Saint Tons. Yes. Or Saint Ton, <laughs> probably. Yeah, Fabian. Fabian <laughs> was the right back. Vinagre was the left back with Magnani and Coppola as a centre back partnership. Duda and Serdar as the double pivot. With Lazovic and Noslim playing out wide and Follerinshaw playing behind Bonazzoli. You disappoint me, bro. Michael Follerinshaw. Michael Follerinshaw. For Italiano's men, it was a 4-2-3-1 formation also, with Christensen in goal, Parisi and Faroni as the full-backs, with Milinkovic and Ranieri as the centre-back partnership, Duncan and Maxim Lopez as the double pivot, with Castrovilli back from injury playing on the left, Icone on the right, Barak playing behind in Zola. Barak, of course, lining up against his former team. The Barack reverse, Obama. The reverse, the reverse fixture was a 1-0 victory for Fiorentina, thanks to a Beltran goal that came in the 78th minute. If you remember, that goal had come out of nothing. Lazovic opened the scoring this game for Verona with a penalty after Christensen brought down Tiani Noslin in the box. A disaster at the back. An absolute disaster at the back between Christensen and Ranieri. So first you see Milinkovic kind of 50-50-ing Noslin and he kind of lets him go because he thinks that Ranieri's got him out of nowhere Christensen comes rushing out you know Christensen that goalkeeper we had seen him in the the the... conference he's always Uh with his tongue out I don't know what the hell is wrong with him Um, yeah he rushed out of nowhere he clattered with Ranieri they like got mixed up and he ended up like hitting Noslin's feet like tripping him with his hand Um, ah yes 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 man Lazovic stepped up and obviously scored the penalty. Um, Castrovilli equalized for Fiorentina. So ro- football, so romantic sometimes. Yeah. Eh, these storylines um, with a left-footed angled drive into the far bottom corner after like dinking the ball over the sliding mm, defender. It was beautiful. That touch. Yeah, that's another candidate for goal of the week. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, marking a return, like. 
properly, you know, yeah. like a proper return. Even in the post, he had a really good game, Castro Villa. Really. And when it comes to considering it was his first game back, his first start back, he played really well. Mm-hmm. Verona reclaimed the lead with Tiani Noslin smashing in a ferocious finish for from 14 yards after a clearance by Milinkovic. Another individual error by Fiorentina, who just haven't been at the races defensively lately, even against Club Bruges. They let in um, three goals yeah. across two legs. Yeah. Um, even though they're through, by the way, they, they're in the final. Yeah, yeah. They drew 1 1. And so a Beltran penalty. Yeah. The last goal Castrovilli scored was on the May 14th. 2023, um, interestingly enough. Fiorentina were so wasteful this game, particularly Giorco jo- Icone. Um, <laughs> Castrovilli was unlucky hitting the post, of course. Barak forced Montepo into a great save. But other than that, there wasn't really much action from Fiorentina. As we have said many times, they're all bark, no bite. Yeah. Um, Verona capitalized on defensive errors to uh, get a very important victory over here. Mm-hmm. I was impressed by Barak's performance lately. He seems to be back. Barak uh-huh. is quite deployable, isn't he? Yeah, he's been back, I think, for the past like f- four or five games. To be honest, I was surprised to randomly start seeing his name in the starting lineup because it almost seems like Italiano would try everything. He was playing Bonaventura in that role, he was playing Beltran in that role. Um, he, he's essentially tried everything not to <laughs> call upon Barak. But Barak has come in and it was good to see him so involved in the last game yeah. where they absolutely demolished Sassuolo. Hilarious. That was Sassuolo's last game and then they beat Inter 1-0. That's crazy, man. And that was Fiorentina's last game and then they lost to Verona. Serie A. <laughs> One thing I haven't mentioned is that on the winning goal of Noslin, there seemed to be a handball. Mm. But weirdly enough, <laughs> the highlights didn't quite show it. At okay. All. Like there's no clear angle on it. And I couldn't find the replay, but at the time it looked like a clear, clear handball. Mm. And in the post-match interview, Italiano was obviously furious about this. He said, "It's a pity because we went behind after our own naive mistake, and Noslin did well to take advantage of it, but then conceded a goal with a very clear handball." He told a dozen. We hit the woodwork yet again. We could have taken the lead in the first half and in the second conceded that goal. It could have gone very differently. Some incidents were just against us today. This is a sport where the fewer mistakes you make, the better you do. Having said that, we give it the first goal and the second one should have been disallowed as Lazovic clearly handled mm. the ball. And it's, it's true. It that, looked that, was, it that, looked was that way. Like I didn't see it in the replays. I didn't see it in the highlights. Like yeah. I don't know. It's, it's almost like... It's weird. Like, come on, show it. Like, show the full thing. Like, uh-huh. you, see, you see them score and Milinkovic immediately does this. He starts uh-huh. tapping his hand, uh-huh. you know. So clearly, uh, like, show what he's saying. Yeah, yeah, it was strange. It was very strange. But yes, another good victory for Hellas Verona, who, yes, man. who yes. did a lot of damage to Fiorentina simply by mirroring their system, containing and taking advantage of the mistake that Fiorentina have been making. Um, and, you know, Fiorentina, as we said, all bark, no bite. Yeah. So they just let them bark and they bit them exactly. while they were On trying the to gasp for balls. it. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh-huh. Um, I mean, that's pretty much it. Well done, Hellas Verona. They are in 14th place now with 34 points. A lot of breathing room for them. They're four points clear of the drop. They've almost done it, man, Baroni's men. I mean, if you want to hear how they've done it, what they've done, you can go back to our previous episodes. We've talked about them so so yeah. many times. Um, Fiorentina are in ninth with 50 points. Um, yeah, one point behind Napoli in eighth. Um, and six points behind Lazio in seventh. So uh, the European dream is becoming a little bit more complicated for Fiorentina, who have it in their hands though to win the Conference League. Though. Yeah, that that that's it. They are officially in the final now. Yes. Um, <clears throat> most likely against Olympiacos. Most likely because of ah, because they won the first leg against uh-huh. um, who was it? They, Villa, they, West Ham. I think they. Marcos. I think they killed them. To be honest, did they? I'll, I'll take a look. Don't worry. If you don't mind, we can set up the next one. Nice. The next one is actually Udinese one, Napoli one. Uh, yes, they beat Olympiacos beat Aston Villa four two in the first. Madonna, league. Madonna, wild. Prem. <laughs> Udinese one, Napoli one. The previous encounter was a four one victory for Napoli. Napoli were forced to reshuffle with Kvicha, Gvaratskelia. Raspadori, Zielinski, Gollini, and then Donker not making the trip. 
The hosts missed Florian Tuvan, Sandy Loverich, Janet T, Silvestri, Delefeu, and Ezibwe, plus band New Imperes and Martin Payero. It's a 3 4 2 1 formation for Cannavaro's men with Okoye and Gold on the back line of Christensen, Bijol, and Ferreira. Kamara on the left, Ezibwe on the right, and the midfield two of Zarraga and Wallace, with Brenner and Samardzic playing behind Luka. Some good size over there, huh? Yeah. 4 3 3. For Calzona's men, with Meret in goal on the back line of Di Lorenzo, Rahmani, Ostigard and Oliveira. Midfield three of Anguissa, Lobotka and Cayuste, with Politano and Lindstrom flanking Osimen. So the first goal of the game came in the 51st minute. The first half was a snooze fest. <laughs> yeah. first no goal, shots on target. In the literally, first half. bro, Nothing. it was. Uh huh, like I'm quite sure I slept. Um. <laughs> 51st minute, Ossiman headed in a Politano cross. It was one of those situations where you think, ah, Politano is obviously going to cut in on his left hand and have a crack, no? Yeah. <laughs> but he, he kept on going to the byline, crossed it in with his right, and Ossiman headed the ball in. Um, Napoli and Ossiman thought they sealed the deal in the 79th minute, but Ossiman was marginally offside in his goal. Ah, oh, can you pour me some, please? Sure, bro. Thank you. And then in the 91st minute, all drama, um, Udinese managed to get the equaliser through success. Christensen's header into the box was brought down and finished off by success to secure a vital point for Cannavaro's Udinese. Um, Firstly, my first point is, and we thought Milan's title defence was dreadful. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. This is the worst title defence I have ever seen in my life. Like I, I, I'm almost... Embarrassed for Napoli <laughs> and the way things have turned out for them this season. Um, and now for the third time running, Napoli saw a victory slip away. They were ahead in the Derby del Sola. They were ahead in the game before that third game in a row where they had the game in their hands and they lost it. What's what's the matter like? Um, I, I think they have many um, players with uncertain futures like... Ozyman Exhibite, the most important player. Probably. Zielinski's off to winter. Zielinski's off to winter. Gvaratskeli has been unfit. He's been injured. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, exactly. So they have a manager who isn't going to be there next season. So uh, they're in a bit of a, a slump right now. A bit yeah. of a pickle. Eh? And, mm-hmm. and the only one who seemed... And the one I feel sorry for the most is Politano, man. Because he's having a really good season. He really is, man. He really is. And, and finally, like... Chucky Lozano's gone, mm. so that right side is his. Like, and and to be honest, because Euro's coming up and everything, I know there's an abundance of talent on the right hand side, but he's very good, Politano man. He he, he, he has yeah. that technique. If he cuts inside and shoots, you have a strong chance he's gonna score, man. A very strong chance. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think there are many players in the league better than Politano at that, at that man. At on that? The, yeah. On that side? On that no. side, uh-huh. There's, there's Orsolini that is very, oh, very good yeah. at it. Uh-huh. Very good at it. It's true. Very similar, actually. Uh-huh. But Politano, his left foot... Berardi can do it actually. Berardi right? can do mm-hmm. it. With Ber- <laughs> Where? Where? Uh-huh. Where is he? With one He's leg. walking again, by the way. Happy birthday... <laughs> You know, the last you. time success scored was in 2023, early 2023 against Cremonese. And now Napoli have let in an Isaac success goal. He didn't score the season. Didn't he score one the season before this? No. No. He got an assist also against Napoli. <laughs> 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 I God, look at that. The only things he's done, if you scroll through um, Isaac's success is history this season, he's, he's got one assist against Napoli, nothing else, and then a goal against Napoli. No, I, I I was sure he scored one this season. Maybe I'm confusing it with the assist. Maybe huh? that's last season, Cremonese. So yeah, crazy, crazy. Weird, yeah. Um, I think Calzona summed it up well in his post-match interview. He said, "When you are up against a five-man defense, you need to move. You need to move them around, or it's just a brick wall. We moved it slowly and predictably." He told Dazzle. That's. Spot on. To Literally yeah, spot They were on. so sluggish the way yeah. they played, the way they moved the ball around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Cannavaro's men, on the other hand, what they did was they sat back and they took it, but then they were ready to burst on the break. And also, the press is something that is... Um, I wouldn't say Udinese look too different, but again, there's that new 
that just that little bit more grinta that new manager grinta mm-hmm. i couldn't give you a, a, i couldn't possibly give you a tactical analysis on how Cannavaro is, is transforming this team whatever he's doing because he's simply right now to me playing a little bit dirty and trying to win the games i don't i can't see a difference between this and chofis to mm. be honest um upon casual viewing i mean if you really analyze it probably we, we will see but yeah um we'll do some reading for the next one as mm-hmm. well some some insight on Cannavaro. and what i what i've seen so far is that he's pragmatic and then the attacks seem a little bit more fluid and i don't yeah. know if that's because the players are inspired or if it's because of a tactical instruction I, yeah i don't know honestly that's true so we'll see yeah um Udinese's chances for survival, despite them being in 18th place, is totally in their hands. How come, Matt? How come? Um, because these are their last three matches. Oh, yeah. These are my favorites. Like when there's three matches uh-huh. left, it's so easy to the prep. You're like, let's look at what <laughs> let's they take have a look at their, les- their lessons, mother, not their, <laughs> their remaining fixtures. Away versus Lecce, home versus Empoli, away versus Frosinone. Three. Massive, massive relegation six pointers, man. <clears throat> well, yeah. the Lecce one, Lecce are still not safe, safe, but they're safe. Oh, yes, 37 points. There's seven points clear of the drop. Uh-huh. There, right? It'd be disastrous if Lecce mm-hmm. were to go down right now. But they're still, they know they we're point. mathematically yes. not allow surviving yet. So, still a massive relegation six pointer. But that Empoli one and the Frozen, one, like. Udinese, Empoli, and Frosinone, for that 18th spot, they're all battling it out. Yes. Um, Empoli, Udinese, Frosinone, and even Cagliari. And bro. even Cagliari, bro. Like, Cagliari, all of them, yeah. all of them are, are, are in it and still. bro, dude. Sassuolo can still survive. Like. Absolutely, especially after the the morale boost they've got. Um, let's, let's focus less on predictions, because honestly, man, my brain is fried when it comes to this my God, when it comes to this relegation battle i literally. think the only way to go about this is to enjoy it yeah and to take it as it comes we've already made our predictions we can't change them every week um i had salernitana sassuolo and frosinone you had i don't remember bro who i had salernitana sassuolo for sure i think i had udinese bro you're on the money right now i will see Yes, balls in Cannavaro's court. Let's see if he's afraid to dribble it out. You yeah, know? Um, purely to Napoli is just a bit of a talking point, but I think we both We've agree that yeah. that's a, a that's good a good good decision. Better for than Napoli. Conte, I think. I think uh-huh. that would be less toxic and destructive. Aha, uh-huh. and when it is an absolute shit show, like it was for Milan <laughs> under not Montella, um, uh, under Giampaolo. Giampaolo, um, Pioli just came in steadied the ship you know and that's exactly what napoli need right now milan had a good thing before john paolo with gattuso where they were getting back on track napoli had a good thing before this with spalletti you know yeah. purely can just go in bring them back at least close to where they were um napoli are in eighth place on 51 points crazy we had to make this prediction last season Udinese in 18th on 30 points two points behind empoli I believe I had made a prediction, bro. I had a, when when we did our our pre season episode, uh. um, I had predicted Napoli out of the top four initially. Then the season started, and I corrected my prediction. Remember, because we had done one after mm. the transfer window closes. Then I put them back in there, bro. I think you had put Inter out of your top four initially but i had corrected that i had corrected before this we guy is just making corrections no 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 Teacher. but before we recorded ah, i had okay. changed it so officially i never had it no done. bro i i remember really? on the episode i was saying um that you're selling me on on internal ah. being top four i mean to be fair they did get weaker transfer wise i would have thought how these players would hit the ground running, huh? Or I'm confusing but it with the season. It could before, be, it could be, be, bro. You just I don't yeah. think any of us saw Inter, <laughs> Inter made it to the Champions League final and yeah. would have said they're not going to make top four. Exactly, actually. That's, yeah, that's a very think... good point, you fucker. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had them in second, all right? Relax. So, Lernitana took on Atalanta. Um, and we're actually leading 1-0 until Atalanta turned this round and won 2-0. For Salernitana, it was Fio- Fiorillo in goal. Fiorillo, yes, Vincenzo Fiorillo. And um, they played a 3 4 2 1 over here. Bear with me, please, guys. Pasalidis was at the back, his full name being 
Trian Tafoy Trian Pasalides um, playing as one of the Hey, where's he from? Alongside Fazio <laughs> and Pirola. Brother Rich and Sambia were on the wings with Basic and Kulibali in the middle. Chauna and Vignato playing behind Chukwubwekimi Ukumwezi. For Atalanta, it was a 3 4 2 1 with Karnesecki in goal, Scalvini, Hian, and Darun at the back with Hatteber and Zappa Costa playing as the wing backs. Ederson and Pasalic in the middle with Lukman and Miranchuk playing behind Skamaka. The reverse fixture saw a trashing and 4 1 for Atalanta with Miranchuk, CDK, Pasalic, Muriel, and Pirola all scoring. Now, match events. Let's take a look at um, the play-by-play, essentially. Salernitana took the lead against the run of play with Chauna's goal, assisted by Vignato. This was a lovely, tidy strike as um, Salernitana countered and and Chauna was played through. He took a few touches, cut inside, curled it in with his left. Lovely footwork by Chauna over there. Atalanta equalized with Scamacca. Um, he tapped. He tapped in a knockdown from Pasalic after Coop Miners, who had just come on, whipped the ball in for the hockey assist. Um, and then good work, of course, by Pasalic to do the simple thing and just square mm-hmm. it across the face of goal. Sometimes they go for goal over yeah. there. And that's yeah. the most frustrating thing in the world. Coop Miners scored the winner with a first-time finish into the far bottom corner after um, a corner was not cleared effectively. He disguised this shot very well, as we said in the intro of this episode. Um, and yeah, it was just a wonderful, wonderful goal. And mm-hmm. it took our goal of the week. To be honest with you, this game was all Atalanta. Um, Salernitana's goal totally came against the run of play. And the second half, they barely got a sniff after Gasperini's yeah. substitutions, who are still saving some energy mm-hmm. for for Marseille. Yeah, yeah it's, um, you know, you could have predicted this one. Atalanta were going to get away with three points. They're very fortunate that this game against Salernitana came exactly at this point where they can go level on points with Roma just above them by a goal difference um, and still have that direct encounter against them and the game against Marseille. So they managed to get level with them now and that direct encounter is all to play for plus they have that game in hand against Fiorentina. So yeah. it, it, it was very fortunate for them to play Salernitana at this point of the season. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. It's three points. It is three points. And they've caught up to Roma in fifth. So this is massive for them. Um, I thought that Lukman was tidy with the ball, but wasteful in this uh-huh. game. I really enjoyed Skamaka. This game, his link-up play was phenomenal. He scored, mm. as always. He had a lovely flick-on, um, super flashy, like technical flick-on to Miranchuk, who mm. was quite unlucky to not score. He crossed the ball from out wide to Lukman as well, who had a pretty good chance to score, but he missed um, he, he, he's he been playing so well, man. And, Is um, he your number nine for Italy? If there's one striker. My number nine for Italy agree. right now is you, you take both of them and you have 10 days of training. You start with Retegui if they're on par because he's proven himself with the national team. The second you need goals, you swap them and slowly introduce Kamaka. That's, that's how I would approach it, to be honest with you. I would start initially with Retegui because he's earned his place and I'm very much a firm believer of of that, I when you say it, he's proven himself with the Italian national talking team, about like the club friendlies, not not to say they're nothing, even, but but even in the the qualifying stage, man, he scored v- many important goals for for Italy. And don't you think that Scamacca is perhaps put on stages that are higher than the stages that Egui is put on, and perhaps yes, definitely, definitely. But however, I I do think it's unfair simply to to bench Retegui simply because someone's having a better domestic season than he is. Um, fair enough. Fair Look, they, schmer, they have, huh? Fair they schmer. Have, <laughs> they have 10... Imagine, imagine you are... You're the head of sales of, of your... Of, the head of commercial now. The head of commercial at your company. Yes, your... Whatever your company, <laughs> you know what I mean. Let's keep that like that. Uh, um, imagine they bring in someone else, bro, and without even giving them a run, they just fucking replace you. Like, you know, no no questions asked. You're doing a good job. You know, your numbers are good, you know. And they bring in someone and just simply because he had a better season last season, like, uh, despite your performance, you're swapped. 
you know, despite your performance at the company. This is very different, though. It's very it's different. I get, I get the, the analogy. The I get job, it, and it makes sense. It makes sense what you're saying, because I would be fucking devastated. Like, I I'll, think I'll, Skamaka, I'll write a blog post yeah. about it, you know? Skamaka this season has been unplayable now, at this at this point in the season. Skamaka and that's has why... qualities that other strikers simply don't have. Yes, that yes. technique and that size and that tidiness and the fact that he can play so well with his back towards goal. And if he has his back towards goal, he has Kiaz on one side, Orsolini on the other side, he has Pellegrini behind him, he has Barella. He'll be excellent. Yeah. And then if you need, if 60th minute, this guy is not fucking working. The same way Chiro didn't work for Italy, for example. Yeah. You bring on Riteg, and you know how Riteg enters the pitch, bro. He's <laughs> just hungry and pressing yeah, and bull. charging. I would do what you said, but the other way around. Start Skamaka first. Start Skamaka. Simply because he's a freak yeah. of nature. They have 10 days in training, and I'm pretty sure Skamaka is just going to impress everyone mm. in, those, in those days. Mm. However, Spalletti, remember, did criticize his work ethic. Yes. So we'll see how he approaches that because you can't criticize someone's work ethic, and because he's doing well at Atalanta, you bring him into mm. your, your starting 11 after. The last time he was there, but he criticized him and didn't call him up. They both criticized him. Gasperini criticized him as well. It's like he needs to stop thinking he's a phenomenon. He needs to stop <laughs> acting like a phenomenon because yeah. he's not. He needs yeah. to do the simple things. And that's essentially like he... Even though he literally scored a bicycle kick a few match days yeah. ago or whatever. He's got the makings of a phenomenon. Let's just yeah, say that. Definitely. Huh? Yes. Um, I believe that is all. I'm not sure if I had another point. This... Ah... Weekly bye-bye to Salernitana. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's it. That's what I was forgetting. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So Salernitana dead last with 15 points all season. I can't remember a team this shit, bro. No, I did. I, I had very eloquently <laughs> posed that question where I said, are they the shittest? Yes. Um, are they the shittest? Out of, the, of the last placed teams of the past since we've had the podcast, yeah, for sure, yeah. I think they're the shittest. I think Cremonese were better. I think Parma Even Benevento were better. the season before. I think were Benevento were better. I think this Southern Italian team are the worst team I've seen in Serie A in ages, bro. Yeah, and that's simply as well because of poor management from the top. If you look at two, the two teams that are the worst run right now in Serie A, the season overall, you have... It speaks volumes how the fish rots, rots from its head, right? That's mm. the saying in Maltese, Luta yeah. or whatever it is. Um, Napoli, defending yeah. champions in eighth. The problem is top down management. Yeah. De Laurentiis sacking him, bringing him in, sacking him, bringing mm. him in. And then you have Salernitana, dead last, who last season had such an impressive survival story. They, they wouldn't let go of Dia, for example. Yeah. They were stubborn with that. They no also disrespect to Wolverhampton. <laughs> they had many um, coaches as well, bringing in different ones. You know, replace. Yeah, it's 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 just tragic for them. So yes, they are dead last with fifteen points, while Atalanta have climbed to fifth with sixty points, tied with Roma, who are in sixth. Yes. How much are Real against Bayern? Still mm. nil nil. Like this extra time penalties. Um. <laughs> this is my last one uh, Cagliari 1 Lecce 1 um, Cagliari wore a brown kit Which I hadn't seen before Pretty swanky Okay I'm just gonna like, uh-huh. Imagine it Blue jeans Tucked in Round sunglasses Bit cool. of disco You know what I mean It's yeah. quite a disco Shirt Cagliari Why didn't you have that When I was there It's true Joseph Menala Just scored a penalty For Slima yes, In the 116th bro. minute Against Berkir This is Kara. This is the The, the cup, the cup. semi-final Berkir yes. Kara had, had knocked out Hamroon Who wow. are now The champions of Malta um, Floriana So Fast It's Floriana the Slima The game final. is Sunday On Mother's Day And Ki has a show I would love to go Watch Floriana Slima Cup final Fuck But it. Would be supporting Floriana, and I don't want to be on the opposing end of Joseph Menala. If you haven't he is a seen legend. our episode with Joseph Menala, check it out. Please do. The Sardinians thought they. Wait, what am I doing, bro? I'm saying how they're out here saying they <laughs> thought they opened the scoring. The previous encounter was also 1 1. Um, Cagliari now risk being sucked back into the danger zone after three points from four rounds. Despite two of those points coming against Inter and Juve, and just before that, 
a victory against Atalanta, the Bean. The Bean. Lecce, on the other hand, are pretty much safe. Viola, sorry, yes, Viola. Viola, yeah. Viola, Pavoletti, Yankto and Mancozu missed out, but Yerimina and Dossena returned. The, the, the Twin Towers. Um, the, that's insensitive, sorry. Um, the visitors were without Lamek Banda. Christovich Kab- must be the plane. <laughs> um, sorry. The visitors were without Lamek Banda, Kaba and Castrio Dermaku, but Ramadani was back. Ramadan. 4 3 1 2 formation for Lecce. Sorry, for Cagliari with Scuffe and Gold at the back line of Zappa, Mina, Dossena, and Augello. Um, Deola, Makumbu, and Nandes were the three in midfield with Gaetano just ahead of them and Luvumbo starting up front alongside La Padula. 4 4 2. For Lecce, with Falcone in goal and a back line of Jean Dre, Bascarotto, Pongracic and Gallo. Udan was out on the right, Dorgo was out on the left and the midfield two of Blin and Ramadani, with Kristovic and Piccoli starting up front together, which is the way Lecce should play, mm. with those two mm. up front together. Um, uh-huh. Uh, the Sardinians thought they opened the scoring in the 16th minute through a Deola strike, which deflected in off Nandes, but this was cancelled as Deola handled the ball during the action. Did he control it and it hit his arm? No. He fucking tackled a player, and when he was in the process of tackling him, he had a low center of gravity, and he stopped the ball with his hand. So essentially controlled the ball with his hand. Weird. Damn. 26th minute, just 10 minutes later... Mina opened the scoring for Cagliari. Um, Mina, I didn't put him in my cream team because he was at Fiorentina for half of the season. But he... Now, though, uh, now. Like, even, not even the second half of the season because he started quite shaky for Cagliari as well. But the right. first couple of games. Uh, he now, took he's, off instead. now he's made, he's been a fantastic partner to, um, to Dossena. Huge, huge. Yeah. And he got the crucial touch over here uh, into the back of the net after a dangerous low cross by Gaetano. Gaetano was like, I'm playing so well, man. I'm the fucking man. Boom! 44th minute Gaetano red card. The ref checked VAR and upgraded his yellow card into a red as Gaetano planted his studs into the knee of Ramadani in a reckless challenge. Um, went for the ball, as typically the challenges go, but still very reckless, very late. And who who puts their stud that high? And then you have the nerve to clap in the face in of the ref. In a six-pointer. In a six-pointer. This is the shit that... You're the attacking midfielder. This is, imagine, yeah. imagine if you're I mean, a that's, ref. That's imagine not... if you're a ref. And... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've already given him a red. There's not much you can do. Um, Knock him in the box. I, I don't know. If that's a good sign. I mean, obviously he got a red card, so it's bad. But it could have been, he could have been just giving it his all. You know what I mean? Mm. It could have been a repercussion of just too much mm. caring, too much. Basically. Like, like imagine, like we said, he fakes it a bit. Just fuck! I got sent yeah. off, and the team's gonna struggle now. Don't be a, a, a spoiled brat out on a loan. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway. In the 84th minute after Cagliari were holding on for so long with 10 men for an entire half against Lecce, um, Kristovic found the back of the net as Ankvist took it to the byline and squared the ball into Kristovic, who knocked it over the line. Just two minutes later after that, Baskerotto hit the post with a bullet header and again two minutes later, Sansone's header hit the post Moments after that, Scuffe was then forced into a double save of Blin and Jean Dre. So Lecce were really and truly smelling blood over there, and Cagliari were freaking, freaking out, out with their tail between their <laughs> legs, really. man. Dude, the thing is, originally I would have said that they were unlucky uh, to not get all three points over uh, here, Cagliari. And then in the 84, because they conceded in the 84 how unlucky they are. After that, they're they're lucky to get one. Point. Absolutely, bro. <laughs> Absolutely, how the game changed, and then Absolutely. obviously, Basquerotto, that would have been his first goal of the season. Oh, that's true. He hasn't ah, scored. He hasn't scored. Took him on Fanta and everything, bro. Like, wow. mean started him, benched Mina, shoot me, you fool, in the dick. Um, 
Aha, here my first choice was is half a season of me not Cagliari enough to get him into our cream team. Um, but this is what I want to look at. The last three games. <laughs> here, we go. here we go. For Cagliari. These are the best, bro. Yeah. The last three games for Cagliari because it's bad, bro. It's, it's bad, bad, it's bad. I'm, I'm seeing it. Milan away, Sassuolo away, Fiorentina home. That Sassuolo one. I think Sassuolo beat them there. Look, Cagliari do best when they have their fans behind them. Cagliari um, got most of their points at home in this season. The Sassuolo games... Are the, okay, let's let's assume that the Milan game is a loss, even though it's not guaranteed that it is, because we've seen how Milan have been, and we've um, we've seen how, what Cagliari can do firsthand up close, when they tighten things at the back. Milan F-worded Cagliari in the last Milan game. Milan F-worded, yeah. and we seem to F-word Cagliari quite, mm-hmm. quite often. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing that gives me hope about the Sassuolo game is the Mape Stadium mm. and the fact that Cagliari can fill that bloody stadium themselves to the point that they get home advantage, Cagliari. We go. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> um, so, ah, that's going to be, that's that's it. That's going to decide what's going to happen this season. That game over there, Sassuolo, Cagliari, man. And then Cagliari, Fiorentina, again, Cagliari are at home. Fiorentina struggle a bit to score. If they keep it tight, they can remain out of that mm. that relegation zone, maybe by getting a point. But they cannot lose to Sassuolo. No. They can't lose to Sassuolo. No. Simple as My man. God, three points for any of those bottom teams changes absolutely everything. 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 If Sassuolo, I think of this, if Sassuolo win a game... They're on 32 points, level on points with Empoli and Frosinone in 17th and 16th. If Udinese win a game, they're level on points with Cagliari in 15th. Quick match. That is how tight this league is at the moment towards the bottom. I personally don't have too much to add about this. No, I mean, um, the game was, was marred. Eh? It was it, ruined. It, it, it is. That's it. The second half, it was Lecce looking for that goal, man. Lecce just bombing forward, bombing forward, and bombing forward. To be honest, Cagliari impressed me that they managed to keep the ball out of their own net for that long. Um, mm. But then, you know, Ankvist takes it to the byline, crosses it into Kristovic, and that's that's all she wrote. Um, yeah. But, you know, <clears throat> considering the early red card, I would say it's a good point for Cagliari, considering the red card. If we look... Before the red card, this is disappointing because they got an early lead. They looked good. They had a goal disallowed earlier. Gaetano really let them down. Absolutely. The other relegation six-pointer was Empoli against Frosinone, which ended in a nil-nil. So um, thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Ciao Ciao. No, 3-4-2-1 for Empoli with Caprile in goal. Berezinski, Ismaili and Luperto at the back with Jazzy on the right. Petzella on the left, Marlon and Grassi in the middle, with Cambiani, Cambiaghi and Fazzini playing behind Nyang. You did it? Nyang. Oh. Nyang yeah. was involved in a, in a car crash. Those of you who remember his time at Milan will know that this isn't his first car crash in Italy. Mm. Firstly, Nyang is okay. Yes. If no one was injured in the crash. Aha. Uh-huh. Thanks. Yes. Thank, thank you, Jesus, I thank guess. Thank you, Lord. Um... <laughs> Secondly, um, those of you who, re- who do remember that Nyang car crash back when he was with Milan, when the police stopped him, he told them he was Traore. <laughs> He's his teammate at the time at Milan. What's yeah, your name, mate. sir? Traore, man. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, what a dick. What a dick, it's true. Who do you blame now? <laughs> He's, like, <laughs> He's like, yes, ma- Emmanuel. I'm Emmanuel. <laughs> Um, Shera Folini was in goal for Frosinone in their 3-4-2-1 formation with Okoli, Romagnoli and Paul Lirola at the back. <laughs> Nadir Zortea and Emmanuel Valeri were on the flanks with Enzo Berencea and Luca Mazzitelli in the middle. Sule and Kedira playing behind. Surely that's a mistake. It's Brescianini and Sule playing behind Kedira. For yes, sure. Yes, obviously. Brescianini up front. Yeah. Now. Paul is P-O-L. P-O-L. Paul P-O-L. Lirola. Paul so, Empoli, I, Paul, Empoli had a, you can tell we start to grow restless towards the end of these <laughs> episodes because we, are, we, we don't, we lose composure completely. Mm. But to he be has, honest, he has ADD and I have, what do I have, man? 
I'm, 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 I'm quite a <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite uh, <laughs> a porny look. <laughs> I can't believe that, that I'm way, apparently, like it's not even a debate who's more porny between me and Zvilar, like. Bro, it's it's so clear, I told you. You saw the poll, you're the only yes, one who voted. <laughs> no. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, the reverse fixture was a 2-1 victory for, for Frosinone. Thanks to goals from Ibrahimovic, Chuni, and Caputo. Do you remember Ch- Ibrahimovic, man? Mm-hmm. Ibrahimovic, I don't know why they hey, stopped playing. Hey, 17 he year old 17 years fucking old. wonder Incredible kid. Incredible when, when we've seen him play. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Um, you said Ch- uh, Cooney, I think. Marvin Cooney, uh, I Cooney. believe. Mm-hmm. Chuni, Cooney, I don't know what to pronounce Chuni, it. Cooney, Cooney was in a mood. Yeah. Empoli had a goal ruled offside when Emmanuel Jazzy fired in the rebound from a parried grassy shot, but it turns out he was offside. So that killed his over-the-top celebrations. They weren't over-the-top, I'm kidding. He, he, he totally it warranted that celebration <laughs> considering the circumstances. Yes. Um, Kedira was quite lively this game. He forced Caprile into a few saves, a few good saves. Um, one with a low drive, the other one with a powerful curler. Um, in the 88th minute, it looked like um, Jazzy handled the ball in the box. Looked like a clear penalty to me. Wasn't given. Again, another weird one. This really week. weird. Yeah. Caputo fired onto the frame of goal from close range in the final minutes. Um, but his efforts were deemed offside, so he doesn't need to be as embarrassed as he should have been. Um, I so said Empoli were going to get relegated. I said Empoli were uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. So, uh, um, this game was, uh, to be honest with you, Empoli did score offside, it's true, but I think no, Frosinone, Frosinone, cre- Frosinone had the could, better could chances have won this. and they were they were better than Empoli, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Empoli kept it tight, um, Caprila was forced into action on a few occasions, particularly on Kedira, who didn't have his shooting boots on, let's, mm-hmm. let's be honest. No, the, the, the thing about Frosinone is, if you are a team that struggles to score, fantastic. Because you let Frozenone attack and attack and, and, and that is where they blow teams of a similar caliber to them out of the water. They are, out of those bottom six teams, even including Lecce, I believe offensively, Frozenone are better than all of them. It's true. Offensively. <laughs> it true. is in the balance and in the defense that they start to struggle. And I would say they have the third worst defense in the league, right? Sassuolo and Salernitana are the only ones under them. That's that's spot on to be honest. And um, if if you look here, they they totally dominated the game, as in they had the, the best possession. Out of them. They took seventeen shots to Empoli's seven. They had five shots on target to Empoli's one shot on target. Uh, the game did feel like a relegation playoff, and both teams were quite fearful at the beginning. It took quite a while until shit started happening, and then eventually Frosinone just got going. Yeah. And Empoli tried to hit against the run of play. Yeah. <clears throat> And that's it. Um, regarding their league standings, um, Empoli are in 17th with 32 points, while Frosinone are in 16th with 32 points, both on 32 points. That is what they call a biscotto in Italy. Um, when they share the points, they share a draw. Typically, it wouldn't be this uh, in these circumstances because they're so close to relegation that I'm sure that yeah. this was not intentional uh-huh. and... Both teams would have easily taken a victory over. The, typically, the biscotto is like, okay, we're not going to send you down yeah, if you don't yeah, send us down exactly, kind of exactly. thing. Biscotto. No, usually it's like, you know, you're 15th, we're, we're like 16th, mm. you know. Um, let's, just, yeah, let's, yeah. let's share the sports. Exactly. Let's not put each other in danger. And let's not yeah. risk ourselves. But yes, that is it for this episode, the guys. We can't fucking wait to see you next week. Um, next week, we will be recording and releasing the episode a little bit early because on the Wednesday, there's the Coppa Italia final and come on, like we're obviously, we have to watch it. We, we're, yes. we're obviously going to watch that. So where, where you get the episode uh, a, a day earlier. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. We love you all. Smash that subscribe button. Yeah, baby.